Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours, where we answer your questions about media production. Let's get into the first one. Alexander? First question. First question comes from Douglas Carmichael. IK Multimedia released the ARC Studio Room Correction System for monitors. For those that can't treat their room, would products like it be beneficial? And he's got a link there. Alexander, start us off. Yeah, so this is one part. This You kind of have to look at this stuff as a holistic approach. Uh, tuning the room, tuning the monitors, that's definitely an important p- process when you're building a home studio. But I would say that... Yeah, to answer specifically the question, is it beneficial? Yes. Uh, but just remember, room treatment is an important part of it. If you've done no treatment to the room and you've got lots of issues with standing waves and uh, base issues, that's going to negatively impact the results of your mix. So you're, can you mix in it in a room like that that's untreated? Yes, but you're going to find that your results are often skewed. It's going to create a lot of problems. So I would look at treating your room first and then, of course, uh, you know, tune the... Uh, uh, the system calibrate the the monitors as well. That would be an important second step as well. Alex, yeah, as Mickey says in the in the in the uh, in our chat, uh, this is really not for fixing bad rooms. Uh, this is to do um, correcting monitor response and time alignment. So it's really not. Um, this isn't a fix for poorly built rooms or poorly tuned rooms. Um, it's just there to do the fine adjustments that are necessary for the speakers. Uh, so there's not really any replacement for that. If you're going to mix something and it matters, you are going to need a good room. And you need a good room that's roughly the size that it, that you are that the, that the audience is going to listen to it in. So if you're in a near-field near room, um, you're going to need one that is actually at least 10 by 10, if not 15 by 15, uh, on a near-field room. Um, and if you're in a th- for mixing for a theater, it needs to be the same size as the theater. Uh, because the physics are completely different, and how the and how those rooms um, absorb and and reflect are different, and so you need really need to have those those there. And if you're mixing for headphones, you could mix for headphones, but then you're really mixing for them. And there is an argument. I mean, I'm in conversations with folks that say, well, you should just mix with your headphones on because that's the way 90% of your listeners are going to listen to it. But I don't know if I would. <laughs> I haven't had the guts to do that. But I but there is an argument for mixing in with uh, with headphones. But you really need, I mean, the first thing I think about when I think about a new room to work in, I'm working in one right now, I'm designing one at the moment, is what am I going to do with the walls? Like it's not what mic am I going to use or what, um, you know, how we're going to process the, you know, whatever. I just look at the walls and immediately think about, well, what am I going to do here? Then after that, we'll start working on the other stuff. Alexander? Yeah, the treatment's super important. It's kind of, you know, I approach this, it's sort of analogous to how, you know, many times we talk about in what order of importance is it for for the stuff that we do here? Should you have a better camera first or should you, should you look at lighting? You know, oftentimes we look at lighting as being super, super critical before even the camera. So the treatment, you know, these days you don't actually have to spend a ton of money. Uh, there are companies like Prime Acoustic that sell these kits. And I would actually look at the Prime Acoustic London kits. Uh, they have different ones for different sized rooms and for... Uh, I think 400 bucks or so, you can get a pretty decent sized kit for a small bedroom that will make a huge impact on the way that room sounds and also will improve the results of your mix. So I would highly recommend looking at that first before you do anything else. Chris? Alex, you mentioned treating the walls. I'm curious, given, you know, your mic and the the noise assist, can you immediately hear the difference uh, when you if you were to take away all the stuff that's on the back wall behind you? Yeah, this is that this, uh, Well, it's not the stuff behind me. I have moving blankets every place you can't see. So any, like literally there's a moving blanket right outside that, that area. It goes all the way around and all the way over me. And this mic specifically is unusable without those moving blankets. Like I've, yeah. I've when I did a breakdown of it, uh, when I broke it, when I was breaking down the set, and it was like a day where I didn't have that. And I had to go back to something like a PR40 or an SM58 because I have to have high off-axis rejection because I because there was so much reflection in my room that this room, all you could hear is the room, you know, and it's completely unusable. So you really have to, you know, it's not that you can't record in that room, but it really limits what mics you can use. You have to have something that is only going to pick up three inches out and nothing from the sides, which is a pretty limited group of um, of mics. But yeah, this in this room, uh, this mic is completely and all you can hear is the room if I if I didn't have the blankets up and the stuff behind me. And and 
If you haven't seen it, go back and look at past episodes. Alex has quite the packing blanket fort that he lives in. <laughs> I'm working on making it look shiny, but right now it, it works. It's a fort. It works. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, everyone always wanted a moving blanket fort, and I have one. Next question. Next question comes from Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Did Google do this $60 million AI Reddit deal to stop MSFT from doing it? And he's got a Reuters link there. Alex? I think they signed an exclusive deal to stop Microsoft from doing it as well. But I think that, that you know, Reddit is a huge opportunity for gathering real-time data you know, to feed AI. And, uh, you know, they had turned off the access to the API. They said, well, they didn't turn it off, but they said you're going to have to pay for it. There's no free access to Reddit because they realized that the value of what they had uh, and what they delivered to AI was very high. And there was no reason to give it away. And for all the people that were complaining, like there's definitely some folks that um, that got hurt by that and people who were writing applications that looked at Reddit and so on and so forth. A lot of good ones. Apollo was a, is a, was a great app uh, to do that. And this made it unsustainable, but you can see why now, because they knew that, that if they turned that pipe off and said, you can't have it for free, that eventually someone would come pay for it. And Google did to the tune of about $60 million a year, which is pretty good for Reddit. And worth noting, Reddit's uh, coming, their IPO is coming up right around the corner. So having a big splashy news story about a, a great deal does nothing but nice things for them. <laughs> uh, next question. Next question comes from Adrian Almvik in Brisbane, Australia. I need to delay a Zoom call going into into vMix by two minutes for legal uh, redactions when required. Any suggestions on how to do this? A basic 4A unit costs 9.5K USD, and it only does 80 seconds of HD video. Chris? This is a really interesting discussion, and Alex, I'd love to hear what, what you have to say about it. Uh, immediately... If I see that you want to be able to do redactions, that means you have to edit something. So now you have stuff going out. Let's say somebody just goes on to an F-bomb tirade and they start, you know, like, oh, got to pull that, got to pull that, got to pull that. So you've delayed it for two minutes. What if they do three minutes of F-bombs? Now, the, the smart thing to do is to put it in like an Elvis because that way you could actually be editing stuff in real time. But what happens when you run out of that buffer time? Alex, do you know? What do they do? Well, so when we use, um, so the the only way that I've really done this, there's there's a variety of, you can get a, a second or two or up to 10 seconds. There's some hardware that will do that. But once you go to the, it, it starts getting expensive. In fact, the 9.5, you know, $9,500 or whatever is a pretty reasonable cost for 80 seconds. Um, it's really hard. Now, Everett's makes one, I think, that, that's a little bit more. It's like $12,000. That'll do up to five minutes, I think, or five minutes of HD. Um, and we, I used to own that that piece of hardware. Um, and we would do up to five minutes of delay. And to exactly Chris's point, we would um, delay things. And the reason we delayed them was less about swearing. And it was more about um, the kind of events that we were working on were there was a potential for an asymmetrical threat. And so what we wanted to be able to do is if there was something that happened badly that we didn't want to show on, on TV, we wanted to be able to hit a punch button and basically just cut out that that area and go a lot. And so what, what it does is it delays whatever delay is. When you hit, when you knock it out, it just cuts to real time. You can't do it twice. So you're, it's really like an, like an EMP. Like you just don't, you know, and, and it just, and you just, you go to, so what you're doing is you're, you're playing out to everyone late and then you can just suddenly just jump to real time, but there's not a way to get back to being able to do it again. And so really it's designed for an event. And now I will say, we use this piece of hardware for a couple of our clients all the time, um, but we never actually needed to punch. Uh, we did once. Yeah, we did. We, we punched <laughs> once. <laughs> like, so it was, and it was swear words and it was, you know, just, it was like a minute and it was for something that was around the Super Bowl. So we needed to like be able to punch out. And, and so it was, um, uh, uh, so anyway, so there was one punch that we've done to to make that actually happen, but it, we used it hundreds and hundreds of times. So it was not a very useful, what well, didn't turn out, but but for insurance and for people feeling better about it, it, it you know, we used it. But where, what we really moved towards so that we had more control was what Chris was talking about. So we were using, we moved to using an EBS, you know, and just rent, you know, just said, this is the cost of doing this delay is the cost of a, of a weekly rental on an EBS. And that's what we, that's what we got. And so the EBS would, it can it can play through in real time, you know, and you can be editing it and working on it, and so so what they use for all the replays for the NFL and for many almost everything else, 
Now, what we would do is define like how much room do we have? And so we would have, you know, you could have up to typically up to two minutes. I mean, we wouldn't, you could do with EBS, it could be anything. It can be 10 seconds. It could be 30 seconds. It could be a minute. But like Chris said, once you run out of time, you're out of time. <laughs> so, so you do have to, um, uh, you know, you have to kind of pace yourself in that area, but you can make edits using IP director is the, is the typical one that you would use inside of the EBS to do that. Um, and so you can make, you have a non, basically a nonlinear editor that you can sit there and cut things out of. Um, and the challenge really is if you're broadcasting it and you're working with press, the press already have that. They already have the information. Like <laughs> so, so the thing we had to kind of outline for folks that is, unless you completely control the live stream, it doesn't really do you any good to delay it because the press is already going to be there. They're already going to have all the footage and you're just going to look bad. You're going to look like you're covering something up if you, you know, you know, cut a, a minute or two out. And so Primarily it doesn't because really... Because you are covering something up. Because <laughs> you are covering <laughs> something up, exactly. So, so it doesn't, it doesn't it, you know, the, the blowback on it is, is worse than just letting it go through. Um, so so that, that's been the challenge with it, but we have done it. And what we've done in some shows is that we delay... We do a growing file using like something like um, uh, uh, Softron's record, you know, on the air record. Um, so we'll use Softron's uh, record to build a growing file inside a Final Cut. So that's always running as it goes through it. And then if we and then we have an EBS as well. Now the and and the reason we do that is because um, then we have two encoders. And what we do is we have two encoders that can um, one encoder that is running two minutes behind and that's what everyone sees and one that's running in real time. Um, so we can, you know, we can uh, switch over, we can make adjustments to that, to, to the delayed one or switch over to the real one by just changing the, the manifest. <laughs> so, so anyway, or the JSON that points you to the manifest anyway. So, so anyway, so the, um, uh, so, but the, the, the reality is, is delays have a very, in today's world where everyone's got an iPhone and everybody is, you know, pr press is all broadcasting and everything else. Delaying it for protection is usually, it, it's someone in management that thinks that this is a good idea and they're not really thinking about the, the overall environment that they're working inside of. So, so I think that it's not probably worth it, but I would say that I don't, there's a three play by, um, you, you could potentially do it with a three play by, by uh, uh, new tech. New tech. Um, that's a replay system. Um, but I don't know if the three play will let you play through and delay it the way you do it with EBS. And then you have these, 4A makes this, Everett's makes another one where, where you can just do the quick dump. Um, and, uh, but that dump is just a one-time one -time thing. Um, so there's not a lot of, in my opinion, there's not a lot of, uh, um, and, and as Mickey pointed out, the Everett's uh, Dreamcatcher. Although it's harder for us to find operators for the Dreamcatcher. So that a lot of times we end up uh, um, uh, using the EBS because of just operator availability. I think the last the last thing, Adrian, I want to point out is just delaying it doesn't solve your redaction problem. So just keep that in mind. Next question. Next question comes from Clive Kitchener in Soup BC Canada. Can someone explain why the same YouTube video is so remarkably different between my wife's iPhone 12 mini and six to seven year old iPad? Both have brightness set to max, both running the latest iOS. Thank you. And then he's got a link showing the comparison of the one overly bright image. Chris, what do you think? Clive, I think in the time span between the iPhone 12 and a seven-year-old iPad, there's been a lot of technology change in the brightness of screens. And I think that uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me like the iPhones get the better screens than the iPads. They might be slightly delayed. I, I, I don't buy iPads, so I don't really know. Alex? Yeah, what's interesting is, is that one looks really blown out. Um, so this is the, it's it's a hard, and it's hard to tell because you have, you kind of have to take both the photos next to each other, um, like in the same, uh, what I would say is that instead of capturing it, I probably um, take the two of them uh, in, you know, with a, with a camera. Uh, here's the, here's the comparison that he's looking at here. And so, um, and so this is the, the two. And so it's actually the one that looks blown out is the, um, the iPad, the older iPad. Uh, and this could be just how it's handling the audio, how it's handling the video. And this, you know, and I don't, I don't have a strong answer for you. Could it be HDR? Than, it's, I don't think it's HDR because he's watching it through TikTok or something, which is not going to be HDR. So um, I think that the brightness, you know, uh, it may be a more intelligent brightness that's kind of, that's there. Um, but I don't know of a reason that, I don't know why it would look blown out. When I, when I read the question without seeing the image, I thought, oh, well, you're watching an HDR video on 
whatever, but it looks like it's just not mapping correctly in the iPad. Um, so it's, you know, and I, I don't have an answer for that, but I will to, to exactly what Chris said, a lot has happened in the last six or seven years to the technology on the, on the uh, iPads and iPhones to make them a lot better. Next question. Next question comes from Ike Potter in Hanover, Germany. When connecting two PCs via USB to the USB C's of the same ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, will both PCs recognize the ATEM as a webcam and receive the same program feed? Can this work to get into different meetings simultaneously with the same feed? Go ahead, Alex. I am told that this works. I have not done it myself. Uh, I just, I, it's, it's one of those things that I've, I, we, we've, um, I know other people who've said that they use it this way, which is that they plug the A10 mini into two separate computers and, and it shows up on both computers as a webcam. And so I, there have been people in there that says it works and Mickey says yes and yes. Um, and so it, you can do that with two separate ones. I have not done it personally because I'm superstitious. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so, but I think it's pure superstition that has kept me from, from going down this path. Um, but, but it should, uh, it, I'm told that it, it works. I have a, a spare one because I usually, if I plug something into my extreme, I'm plugging in a, a hard drive. Um, so I don't, I don't usually plug in a, um, uh, you know, plug it into another computer, but we'll, we'll try to give it a shot. But I, it, Yes, people have said that that works fine. Next question. Next question comes from Hazma Kajar in Cape Town, South Africa. As I traverse India with my iPhone 15 Max, many opportunities arise. Suggestions on the deeper settings on iPhone to capture memories. I am simply framing and shooting right now. Alex? I mean, in India, that's a pretty, you know, it's, it's a, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to take some incredible photos. Um, the thing that I would do, you know, that, that I've done in India is a, there's a lot of great sculpture and all kinds of other things that are there to shoot. And what I tend to do is shoot it from a bunch of different angles. So think about um, trying to lock your camera to raw. So you get 48 megapixels and you, and it's a, it's a raw and make sure you're using only the one X lens because it's going to be the only one that'll shoot raw properly. And then what you want to do is if you're in a scene, if you're in a location that you might want to try building a photo, do some photogrammetry. So in India, like for instance, I, I found a, in the spice area of old Delhi, you know, there's an area with spice and you can kind of cut through these halls, you can cut through these little areas and you can end up in a block that's inside of another block. So it's literally houses and everything else inside of a block and opened at the top. And um, other than protecting your phone from the, uh, from the monkeys, um, the, uh, the, you, which is a thing, like you think I'm joking. I am not joking. If you get too close to them, they'll just reach out and grab your, try to grab your phone. And so, um, and so I had to play tug of war with one about, with my phone. And so I was trying to get a little too close to taking the picture anyway. So the, um, uh, so, but what I did is I went all the way around, I took about 190 photos, uh, around that so that I could build a 3d model of that little, that little area there. So I do a lot of, I mean, that's what I do is I take lots of photos. And so, the so I took that photos. I'll I'll take if I see a sculpture, I'll take a whole bunch of photos. And the idea is, if you think about an object that's here, what you want to do is you're taking photos like this. You will look strange, and your um, the Monty may make fun of might make fun of you for doing all of this, but um, but you should do it anyway. Anyway, so the um and so what you want to do is you want these each picture that you take of the object to overlap, and you want to take them if you think about it from the side. You want to take them high, middle, low. And you can get a lot of information and um, and then you can put them into, there's a variety of different programs. Meta, I use MetaShape a lot because it's really easy for me to just throw things in, let it cook and come back and see how it went. But there's a lot of things you can do there. Um, so I would take a look at that. You know, I love, you know, there's so, uh, India is such a fascinating place that I love um, taking pictures of um, uh, people making things, people making, you know, there's street food, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, pawn is something I like taking a video of someone making, which is really good and not legal in the United States. So, so it's, it's nice to um, take, it's nice to take photos and try to explain what that is. Um, and so, but people doing things, uh, the street experiences, the, um, you know, all of those things I would take, I would just take lots and lots of photos. Um, and uh, it's an incredible, uh, it's an incredible place, but mostly what I take pictures of are people doing things because it's so different from what we have here. And if you happen to be shooting video, um, definitely get the Blackmagic camera app and, and play with it. Uh, but nope. play with it before you're in front of something you want to take video of because there's a lot of play, there's a lot of knobs and a lot of things you can turn. And if you're just doing run and gun, it's going to be easier to just pull out your phone and open up the camera app. The other general note that I would give you, Hasmuk, 
is keep in mind your media storage as you're shooting at these much higher uh, higher file size uh, formats. But also make sure every single time that you are some that you're uh, somewhere that has an internet connection or somewhere where you can connect your phone to your laptop, back those photos up. Because should a monkey decide to abscond with your phone, <laughs> you don't want to lose all of your stuff. The um, uh, the other thing is, is that I will say, and I didn't do it in India, but in Cambodia, I shot a bunch of stuff where I took my iPhone and put it into a stabilizer. It was a little dangerous with your iPhone to do this. I don't know if I do it with my Macs, but I did it with a second phone that I had there. And um, uh, sunroofs and stabilizers and, and, and cameras is pretty awesome if you're not going down a highway. Like if you're going through the town, you can shoot it. You can go. You can get these great time lapses and all kinds of you know. Um, and shooting out of a car while you're driving, and just getting stuff going by is great. If you're going to build a video, having that as a glue that kind of glues things together of where you went is uh, is pretty awesome as well. Next question. Next question comes from Douglas Carmichael on the Dylan Scott tour. The monitor engineer also runs Resolume for video. What has your experience been with one person doing multiple roles? And he's got a mix online link there. Go ahead, Alexander. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I've tried it. Uh, as a front of house engineer, uh, there's so many things going on. I need to be able to focus at a moment's notice. Uh, you know, when the guitar player plays a solo, I'm pushing that solo up in the mix a couple dB. When the chorus comes up, maybe I'm pushing the vocal up a couple dB. I'm making sure that nothing's feeding back. And if something feeds back, you got to be on the graphic EQ to pull down those frequencies. You can't be messing around with cameras. You can't be messing around with lights. You can't be messing around with playback. Like that is a, th These are separate jobs, so I do not recommend it. Alex? The real problem is, is that sometimes it works. Um, so, it, it, and that's the, that's what gets you is that you might, you'll do it the first time or the second time. And you, you, you were careful because you thought that, you know, oh, this worked pretty well. I mean, but you didn't do very much the first time because you were afraid of it. Then you get confidence and you think, oh, I can do this by myself. And then you start doing shows that way. And then you're not really being uh, conscious to the fact that you are, um, uh, that you're putting yourself at an incredible amount of risk. Um, and so what, what, anytime you understaff, whether it's doing it by yourself or doing it with a handful of people, you are setting yourself up for what we call a cascading failure. So it isn't that something goes wrong with what you're doing at that moment. It's that something else goes wrong and you have to go fix that. And then things just start to unwrap, you know, because this get, this falls apart and then this falls apart. And suddenly you don't have enough people to cover all the, you know, there's a whole bunch of things happening and it's, you know, and, and, and you're, and it's not, the hard part is, is it's not the thing that went wrong first that's really what co happens. It's two minutes later or three minutes later, the whole feed goes down or something gets, you know, because because things are unwrapping as you let go of them. And so, um, but that's what we call a cascading failure. And it is a really, you know, it's doing a live show and having something go wrong that you can't fix, especially when you're, you're there by yourself. I, I often ex uh, try to describe to people as, it's like cutting your arm off with a butter knife because it is just this horrible feeling that you're there, there's a whole bunch of people watching and there is nothing you're gonna be able to do about this. It's just gonna go badly, you know? And, and it's just, it's, it's embarrassing, your clients are upset, the, you know, and everything else. And you'll do, you have to do it every once in a while because after you've done it, you will do almost anything you can to avoid it doing it again, you know? And, and so you'll always be like, oh, I just, I, I, I turn down jobs that I don't have enough people for. If they don't have enough people to do it, I'll be like, ah, I don't think I'm the right person for you. <laughs> like, you know, I don't think that that's there. It doesn't mean that I never, I've done some events where I do them by myself, but they are super simple. Like, and I spend a lot of time working on them. Um, and, you know, so the prep is done with a lot of time and they're, they're very like contained and we can't add anything new and we have to be very careful. And I add things but like the Michael Krasny show is a good example. I do that large, not by myself, but large, you know, I do the actual edit by myself. We have other people helping off, on, you know, off site. Um, but I only add one new thing per week. So if you if you watch that show, it's going to be on later today. I add today, this today is questions in the lower third. <laughs> like that was the new thing, you know, and, and, um, and, uh, but I had one new thing every week, um, that, to make it slowly more complex, but I don't, um, but I don't start adding a bunch of things and it's all very contained. Like it's one person that he's talking to. We can't have more people. We can't do, you know, like that's all things that I'm, I'm slowly building up for, but I, I'm very careful about it. And I spend hours kind of rebuilding the, over the weekend to make sure that like whatever I learned on Friday, I go, okay, well, this is, you know, whatever that is. So. 
happening. I've heard Alex say on more than one occasion, if it matters, make sure it's going to work on a rainy day, not just the yeah. sunny days. Uh, exactly. Alexander? Yeah, that's all great advice. And as a monitor engineer, and I, I treat, you know, no matter where that the level of that band is, whether they're amateur or or a pro act, I try to treat all those jobs as a professional. So if you think about it from the band's perspective, if you're a monitor engineer, if the talent is telling you to make an adjustment very quickly, you have to be able to react. And they need, in their monitors, they need to be able to hear what they need to be able to hear. And they get really upset. If they can't hear their own vocals or they can't hear the bass line to stay in time, that's critical. And I would never, ever want to be late or just be fumbling and having to find the buttons. So that's just, that's that's my perspective. And for our, our math lesson day, today, uh, Alex, can you give us the calculation for risk? <laughs> risk? Risk is the chance of something going wrong to the power of the consequences. <laughs> so so, so the, if, if you have a, high con, a lot of consequences uh, and the, the risk can be very low, but if, the, if a high, if a, you know, a risk, it can be the, the, the chance of something going wrong times comp, consequences. But if the consequences are, if the consequences, the reason I do free shows, like we do like, hey, let me do something. And we do a, whether it's covering an event or we did a soccer game last year or other things like that and we don't charge anyone, that lowers my risk a lot or that lowers my, the consequences because everyone's just happy we're there, right? Like they're not, you know, the, and, and we're just, whatever we add is going to be better. And then my consequences are low, so I take a lot of risk. We take a bunch of people that haven't done this before and we take a bunch of gear that haven't, haven't, hasn't haven't happened. We take lots and lots and lots and lots of, uh, of um, chances with it failing um, because the consequences are very low. Uh, if the consequence gets higher, we stop taking those chances and we hire a different setup. You know, we hire people who have done this a thousand times and we hire equipment that we've already tested and we build it in the studio and in, in this, in the, you know, somewhere and make sure that it's working. So. All right. Next question. Next question comes from Richard Armstrong in London. How can I create my own third person 2D videos on the Vision Pro and an iPhone showing the perspective of the person wearing the VP and including the digital content they are interacting with, like the Apple promo videos of the AVP? Jason? On its best day, um, it won't look like Apple's. It won't look like those promo videos. But um, yeah, uh, I'd say I've, I just got this developer strap. It is substantially better um, to connect directly to a Mac and to record. It'll just come in through QuickTime, and um, it, it is much higher quality. From there, you're doing a screen recording, and you're jam syncing, and then it's a lot of editing. And, and Jason, is that... Uh is it true that that is not the foveated render that you actually get full sharpness across the frame when you do it that way? Honestly, I haven't had time to go back and look. I've had, you know, five minutes to play with it, so I don't know yet. Okay, cool. No worries. We'll, we'll, we'll check back with you. Alex? The, um, yeah, the, the, I think there's two things here. One is how do you shoot an external of you? And so one of the things you can, of course, do is an iPhone. If you're doing an iPhone, think about shooting a little wider than you normally would. Then you can kind of pan and scan inside of it if you're going to move around a little bit. But the other thing to look at is there's a variety of tools. There's some tools that you can you can connect to your iPhone, so you can put your you put your iPhone into a little um, a little turntable that will turn back and forth. And what it'll do is it'll do all that tracking for you. So it'll track you and let, move back and forth with you. These are as little as 150 dollars and or even less. And as much as three or four hundred dollars, and what they'll do is they'll just pan and scan with you. So as you're moving around in the headset, the the iPhone will just. So then you set that iPhone up, you hit record, put the headset on, and you'll have a bunch of leader. But you'll put it on, and now and then the way to record the headset is uh, you can use uh, what what Jason said. I haven't used that, but it, you can, and it definitely is a higher quality. Um, but the, what I do when I want to show my headset is I share it. I screen share it with. Uh, I mirror my my view. Um, to an Apple TV. And so then the Apple TV is um, going out of HDMI. Then, then you're, that's your HDMI out. You put it into something that can record. And so now you can you can record it. And then what you probably want to do is, is with pass-through, just clap like that so that you can sync the two, um, you know, uh, later. So if you do that clap, you'll, you'll be able to pull them back together there. And that's going to give you the ability to have a camera that's kind of moving with you back and forth in, in your environment as well as um, capturing your view of that scene. The only other thing that'd be missing is if you really wanted to show your, um, if you really wanted to show you as a digital character, 
then the next thing to do would be to FaceTime somebody else and have them record the output of that to, um, you know, to a, to a, so you, you could do it to yourself. You call yourself somewhere else and have the HDMI output of that go into, um, you know, go out of HDMI. In fact, I think Zoom supports, now supports uh, the Apple TV. So you could theoretically do it with two Apple TVs and a, and an extreme ISO or an ISO and, and record both your view and that view. It's, it's an interesting puzzle. I'm, I think the Apple TV only like works like, like with, with the iPhone linked as that camera. I don't think you can change that. I know, but you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to have some other, but you could have some random iPad, I, I, iPod to do that. Or I, I, I mean, no, iPhone, because you're not using that part of the video. You're only using the return. So it'd be an interesting project to try to figure out how to do all of those takes, but that would be the way that I would start to think about it. Just a reminder, coming up uh, for our second hour today, we're talking all about VLAN. So we've got uh, John Wallace and Bo Cordell are joining us for the second hour. We're going to talk all about uh, just general concept of VLANs and then how we're all using them in our productions. Also, tomorrow is our Office Hours Volunteers meeting. So if you are a Office Hours volunteer, that is our monthly meeting to check that out. If you were at the new volunteers meeting last week, come on to this one and see what it's like from the day to day. Uh, next question. Next question comes from Clive Kitchener in Souk, BC, Canada. Are quality spinning hard drives still considered best for backups, or have SSDs become so cheap those are now the go-tos? Go ahead, Chris. Clive, there's a couple of things here. Uh, back, first of all, backup and archive are different things. I know you said backup. So the question is, is this like a daily backup? You got to do it quickly? Or is it just, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure like... You know, you have a time machine or something going on a computer, and I apologize, I don't know what the equivalent to that is in the Windows world. I always kind of chuckle when people go, "Gee, SSDs are so much cheaper." This is a the quickest of of uh, uh, Amazon searches. SSDs are not the same price as hard drives. They're not less than hard drives. They're still more expensive. They're quite a bit more expensive. Uh, we recently went through this at the office and hey, SSDs are getting cheaper. Should we change them? I was like, no, no, we could definitely do it cheaper. However, if it's like a daily backup, like I want to make sure that I've saved all my work today, I would have a SSD for that, mainly just for the speed. Alexander? Yeah, for any for for backup uh, and long term storage, archiving, all that sort of stuff, I still go to the to spinning drives just because, like uh, Chris said, there, uh, the cost per, per terabyte is still dramatically lower. Now, to answer specifically about the quality of the drives, there not all spinning drives are the same. There are uh, manufacturers like Seagate, Western Digital, for example, they have different product lines for different things. So I would look at the network attached storage or NAS uh, or slash enterprise grade drives. Those are actually rated for a much longer lifespan. Those are, um, they, they handle wear and tear a little bit more. So for putting into servers, for storing a lot of important data, I would look at those drives that are a little bit more money. They tend to have a little bit more cash as well. So those are the ones that I would look at. Alex? Yeah, and oftentimes what you want to look at, I, I agree that SSDs are great for near line or online because they're so much faster. And especially if you raid them, you can get these incredible speeds. But a spinning drive is a, um, uh, a spinning drive is going to give you a lot more capacity for the same price, like <laughs> five or six times as much capacity. And at five or six times savings, you can, what we did is we put a copy on two different drives. So we had two identical drives for the things that we were backing up. And then we had a schedule for how spinning them up. So there was like a little tickler that said, oh, so they just kind of work through um, the, the shelf and put them on and do a search to just run the drive um, about every, within every six months. And we had at one point, Pixel Core had probably nearly 2000 drives um, that were like that. And uh, we could find something in 15 minutes and pull it off. It'd take a little bit of time to do the copy, maybe a couple hours to pull the copy off. Um, so that's the that's the time it takes to pull, you know, the, that that write speed or read speed and write speed are the are the real problem. Um, that you have pulling those off. So that's the one thing that you give up, but it's really, really inexpensive. And you get little cassettes. There's like cassette holders that just look like cassette holders that you'd have for a, for a videotape, but it's for these. Um, the other thing you want to look at is the cost of per terabyte um, usually goes like this with, with spinning drives. It goes like this and then it starts to go up a little bit and then it goes like that. Like there's some point here where, you know, this, you know, 10 terabytes, oops, I did it again. But 10 terabytes and 14 terabytes is a, a much bigger difference or 16 terabytes is way up here. 
usually we live wherever that wherever the elbow of that hockey stick is is what we buy you know so we don't buy the really big ones small ones aren't efficient because that takes up a lot of space the big one and, and you're not saving anything so really what you want to look at is what is your cost per terabyte is what you're looking for and there'll be some point in the world where it always spikes you know because now the, the biggest drives right now that i've seen are 24 terabytes per drive um, and which is just massive, but the cost per terabyte goes up when you get into that. And oftentimes, and what's really interesting, I was looking at this for this, for this, um, <laughs> this is the interesting thing is, uh, here's like a Seagate iron wolf, which are pretty high quality. Um, and you have 12 terabytes, but if you go down to 10, it is $35 more. But if you go up to, you know, for, for the 10 terabyte, which means that the, their factory is, has been optimized for 12. If we go up to 16, now, if it was even, it would be another, uh, you know, it would be about two hundred fifty dollars, and this is three hundred dollars. So the spike is between, I would say, the spike is between twelve and sixteen terabytes. Um, and then if you go up to LTE, about eighteen terabytes looks like. Yeah, so you, you can see how the numbers start to change because that density is cost. So what we would, and and it's been somewhere between ten and twelve terabytes for the last year or two um, of what the of where the most efficient drives are per terabyte. But that's what you want to look for. Now, if you're using uh, the drive for continuous backup, like uh, similar to like an Apple Time Machine, where you're just writing to the drive every single day, and eventually you're cycling out the old data and bringing in the new, do you run any risk in that scenario I, I of burning out the Five. SSD? Five dot one RAID. Okay. Like if you're if you're doing stuff, you know, like like if you're doing ongoing backups. It's a it's a five no, or a whatever raid five not five dollars five dot one does it get a center speaker I, I with was, that I was yeah. mixing I was an where's LFC the subwoofer it's surround I want the subwoofer it's surround I it's it's are still early in the morning I haven't had enough coffee so it is a raid five is what I use for that so the raid five is what we back up to um, in that area um, and so but if you did five dot one. It just has a lot more storage in the in the LFE, you know. So yeah, I was going like to say this, you need the spinning a, drive raid. because it has more of a rumble. Yeah, exactly. And it has it has a <laughs> but it has a separate. You can't really you can't save to it, but it adds a lot more beef to the. You know, you don't hear it, but it's, it's got a lot more beef to it, um, and it, it it rumbles a little bit more. So yeah, so the but the yeah so the, but I would um, you know the ongoing stuff. That's what I that's what I'd look at. Raid five, but with a spinning drive, right? with spinning drives. I'd have, you know, four or five drives, have it be RAID, stripe it, RAID 5, or not stripe it, but set it up as RAID 5. And at that point, um, you, you're pretty safe there. And then you're taking your old stuff, when you take it off, that's when we take a, we take a project, typically, and we save it to two different drives and then put them in two different places, that kind of thing, to, to save them out. Um, and then, uh, but when you're working with it, when I'm, I wouldn't use that RAID 5 to work off of, I would work off. I mean, I really like M NVMe and, and you can now build NVMe's that are like 24 terabytes or 36 terabytes or whatever that are all M just little memory cards essentially. And um, so you can work off of that, that's super fast. Um, and then you back it up to the RAID 5 and you can do that overnight, let it just keep on updating it. And then then when you're done with it, you package it up and put it on some, some spinning drives and put them on a shelf. Next question. Next question comes from Daniel Lund in Proctor, Minnesota. Uh, cutting sound, I had a big problem with noise coming into my mic from the boom springs. Uh, pool noodle cured that. Alexander? Yeah, I mean, you're describing the, uh, the exact issue that I have with a lot of these types of uh, booms, which is, which is why I avoid buying them. Um, I will say, however, as far as the springs are concerned, there is a quality difference a big one between the $40 knockoff ones you find on Amazon and the ones that OC White makes. So you'll find that OC White does make a variety of these type of uh, broadcast boom arms with, with springs. Those ones are a lot higher quality, but over time, over 10 plus years, they will start to squeak and make all sorts of noise. Uh, so you can, you know, you can find stuff to dampen it. One thing you could try that um, may work is there's a product called Moon Gel that drummers use to dampen their toms. It's a little jelly material it's very, very inexpensive, a couple dollars. You can find that at your local music uh, store in the drum department. So you may want to try that and just put that across the springs and see if that uh, helps the problem too. Alex? My only question is, uh, what color did you use? Um, so if we look at these, I mean, we have, we have these, you have noodles and you can get black ones, of course, but you can get blue ones and, and gray ones and green Christian ones. Christian Bale, does this come in black? Yeah, exactly. So you have all these, all these options for pool noodles. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I could do pool noodles myself. The um, I I I uh, you're, what you're outlining though is the reason that I stopped using uh, anything with a spring in it. So 
Um, I have an, this is an OC white arm and, but I also use the, um, the low profile from Elgato. We've sent those out to, to guests and partners and so on and so forth. Um, and those, those work great as well. Um, the, I would say for most people, the, if you're not using it six hours a day, um, I probably get the Elgato one. I use it six to eight hours a day. So I have the OC white one. It, it's amortized itself well. Um, so the, um, uh, so I, I think that, um, but what you want to look for something that is going to stay quiet and you're going to spend a little bit more money on it if it's going to, if it, you know, otherwise it's going to drive you crazy over time. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I think that the spring ones, while m much less expensive, um, are going to be a constant problem in my opinion. And I've had lots of spring ones. I had spring ones for probably two decades before I even knew that something else was there. And so the two things that I would recommend is a, it's really, really nice to have an underslung. You'll see, I think almost all of us are on. I think all of us today are under have underslung arms. And that means that they're not bumping into our monitors. They're not in between us and our monitors. A lot of us have multiple monitors. They're easier to frame in the in the uh, ni nicely. So um, really underslung arms is the way you want to go. And then not having springs in them and having some kind of uh, gasket or, or, you know, other other ways of, of managing that tension is really useful. And Daniel, thanks for getting that one into us via the QR code. Uh, you can ask questions at askofficehours.global. Um, that's how Daniel put his question into us. Uh, also, uh, obviously, you can go into Makana and submit your questions as well as vote on the other questions and live chat with the other producers. So uh, if you've got VLAN questions, now's a good time to get those in because we've got a great second hour coming up after this. Next question. Next question comes from Peter Junison in Sweden. Aiton went into receivership on the 15th of February, so now bankrupt and closed down. Gone forever, or will anyone pick them up like Sony, Blackmagic, or Sure? Alex? Sure feels like an opportunity for Blackmagic. <laughs> That's all I got to say. So it, it feels like, a, and I don't know what the rules are of how Blackmagic does this, but when you look at their history, what they've done typically is taken a company that usually is right before receivership. It's not when they go into receivership because you kind of lose positive control over that process. But but usually um, uh, they go in there and they assume the debts or they do whatever. They, I don't know what the business thing is that they do, but they do something. And almost all the products that Blackmagic has had, whether it's Resolve or ATEMS or uh, Fairlight, have all happened where they take a company that's in duress and they, um, and they buy them and then they apply. Uh, they take the efficiencies that Blackmagic has and the network that, you know, and the, and the overall ecosystem that Blackmagic has and they make it profitable for Blackmagic. I think Anton would actually be a really, uh, a ton or, is it a ton or a ton? Um, anyway, so um, uh, would be a great solution for them. The recorders are a little um, out there, you know, as far as setting up, you, they, they are a, 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 I mean, I think that there's a reason at some point that people, you know, had a hard time with it because they're just crazy uh, recorders um, or crazy looking recorders. Let me show you here. This is, this is what they, what they look like. They're very powerful and I, and when, and people who love them, um, is, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes really love them. Um, you know, and so when you see them, they're just, it's very, very organic and very, very analog, but with the digital uh, backing to it. And again, the people who love these really love them. Um, and so, um, but, but, everybody else looks at them like, what? <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do with that? Fenwick's face right now. That's exactly yeah, what it was. Yeah. The, um, and uh, anyway, so the, they're, they are, uh, but I think have. if you, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Fenwick's like, I know, that, that's his new interface for his computer. But what I would say is that what would be great is to see uh, Black Magic. Black Magic, I feel like one of the Achilles heel for Black Magic is their preamps and some of their, you know, field stuff and everything else is they're building this out. You know, they have Fairlight, but they don't have any, you know, the interfaces have never been very good as far as how Blackmagic handles this. And now you have a company that may have some knowledge in that area. So it, it would be really interesting to see um, them pick it up and do what they've done with the other ones, which has made taking something that didn't didn't have a good business model, but had great technology and turn it into great technology and a good business model. And so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Next question. Next question comes from Edwin R. Ruiz in Chicago. What is the smallest power conditioner for a portable rack you would recommend for travel? Alex? Furman. <laughs> Furman, Furman is what we use for, uh, uh, there's, no, there's a difference between conditioning and UPS. So for UPS, um, typically we, we travel with the, um, uh, we, we travel with the APSs, 50, the 1500 VA, VAs are the ones that we travel with in the United States. 
if we go overseas, we either buy them before we leave or we buy them locally. They're usually pretty easy to find. The big advantage of the, the 1500 VACs is because we can we can take out the battery and, or flip the battery. And, um, and, and then you have to put a bunch of stuff on the outside of your outside of your uh, baggage to say that you're, that this is a, you know, this is the kind of battery and that it's been disengaged and you know, all those things, but you can do it. But you just remember that all conditioners, or I think almost, almost all the conditioners and all UPSs are, uh, they are voltage dependent. They're not going to, you're not going to get a 110 to 240, um, you know, conditioner because of how it works. And so, so you do need to get it to where you're, where you're going if you're traveling. Um, you have to make sure that is it is it a what what city is it the United States where it's going to be you know the one ten or one twenty there's going to be two twenty or two forty um, and those are going to be the things you have to kind of decide there. But Furman is what all of us I, I don't know everybody that I know uses. I'm looking at the the chat. Yeah, Mickey said Furman as well. So yeah, Furman, 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 Furman. <laughs> that's what we do. That's what we use. Jason, yeah, a hundred percent Furman. And kind of as a quick aside. For about three square inches and roughly a hundred bucks, these actually work pretty well. It's a 10, um, 10 amp max per component, but I've had really good luck with these if there's noise in a rack. IFI is the company. Um, they I started with one of these with you know way back when with a USB sound card. If you're conditioning voltage because you have a ground loop. Um, you know, a voltage conditioner may or may not fix it. These, however, will absolutely knock it out. So those are the two QR codes, one for the rack mount thing and then the other one for the USB inline. Whenever I'm trying to show off my AV closet, I just take the little lights, the little rack lights and pull them out of the Furman and turn all the other lights off. It's like, and this is where all the equipment lives. And everybody's like, yes. ah, I see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next question. All right, we got a QR code question here from Gabriana Echesso Mistiera from Sault Ste. Marie. Monday was iSafe Day and huge for TV, film, media, creation, industry. Asked Tuesday how people commemorated it. Not sure what lessons were learned about YouTube, but what lessons did you inspire in others on the 10th anniversary of Sarah Jones' tragedy? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I mean, a lot of... It, it, there's always going to be safety breakdowns and usually it comes to to being um, uh, in a rush and then people stepping over things oftentimes and someone not saying something because they feel like they're going to be fired or they're going to be, you know, they're going to be that, that, that person or whatever. But I think that, and I think that's one of the things that is actually pretty good about union sets is that union members are generally not afraid of saying, hey, that's not safe um, uh, or, you know, and it's even little things. I mean, I would say, it's not just the big things. I mean, Sarah Jones, for those who haven't seen it, were hit by she was hit by a train because they had her on a track that there was no way to get off, and um, and they you know they had been warned that this is a bad idea. And we saw this with Rust in in New Mexico, where you had people out there shooting with a gun that was then going to be used as a prop, and and which is just insanity, like insanity, like you, you, it's hard to like even get your head around you know, doing those kinds of things and people just get loose and they get, they think that the thing that really gets people in trouble is, is thinking that, they, that they've got it handled. Think that, you know, not, and not being, you know, a lot of times those of us in production will see somebody that we're working with and someone will ask, ask you about them and you'll go, well, they're not scared enough. Like they're not scared of what they're doing. <laughs> like, you know, like this is what we do is dangerous. There's lots of big things. Now there are times when things get out of hand. I've been in places where I was like, oh, let's not do that again. Like, you know, and, you know, um, uh, where things just, you know, what happens oftentimes with safety is it's not the thing that you made that decision about. It's what starts to happen around that thing. And you just can't quite get back to like, there's no way to fix it once you're in it and you're trying to figure that out. And so th those are the challenges that you have there. But um, many of those challenges were just lack of, uh, you know, lack of forethought. And oftentimes people just not, again, get back to risk, the chance of something happening and the consequences, uh, you've multiplied by the consequences of what happens or or to the power of the consequences of what that um, uh, of what happens if that happens, and especially when you're dealing with life and death situations. But there have been um, you know actresses and actors that have been crushed by lights that fell down that, that have done things, and, and it's just it's often it's just done by folks that aren't scared enough, you know, about what we do. And a lot of times you've got a lot of heavy, 
you know, like we, like someone will say, hey, can I go help with the electric, electrical? And we're like, hey, we've got people to do that. And we're going to have them do that. <laughs> like, like, we're not going to have an intern, like we'll have a PA run and get food. We're not going to have a PA plug the, the leads in, you know, um, to the thing. But that's the kind of stuff that happens because you're running out of time and you think, oh, that, how, how hard is that? And it's, it's, you know, everything starts with that'll be easy. You know, or this is going to be easy or this is going to be, you know, we, I, I don't want to hear anyone ever say on a set like, oh, that'll be easy. I know that they don't know what they're talking about anymore <laughs> you know, because it's just, you know, so many things can go wrong and, and you, and you're always paying attention to that. Like we, the big thing that I, I know this is on to settle this all down, the day-to-day -day thing that people make a mistake about all the time is picking up heavy cases by themselves and without using their knees. I know that sounds like a little thing, but if you do a lot of production, we had a problem where we had a lot of people hurting their backs. And when you hurt your back, it takes a long time to recover. And sometimes you never really recover from that. And it takes a lot of recovery. And so we get into this like, you'll see people come out of it and it's a 60 pound bag or a 70 pound bag. And at that point we're like, hey, two people, putting it into the, into the thing and people, I can do that. And they want to be, you know, um, and I'm just, we're always like, mm, but you don't need to, I know you can, but you don't need to, there's two of us here. <laughs> like, and then we're going to, we're going to use our knees. We're going to pick it up. We're going to put it in. And those are the kind of things that I think people skip over, but they skip that kind of thing all the time. Um, just basic ergonomics, um, that you have to pay attention to. Alexander. Never try to pick up a 170 pound subwoofer. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had one we were trying to get out really fast and I I thought the two shot bags that I picked up were like they were shot bags not sandbags and I thought that they were um I thought they were like each 20 pounds or something like that yeah they were each 100 pounds and I was still in a rush and I just did it and I felt like I had compacted my my spine, you know, but it was like we were in a rush. We were in the West Room, in the West Wing of the, of the White House. And I just picked it up and I was like, I'm going to get him out of here. And I could feel my whole body. You know, like I, I have, a, you know, and the problem is you get a tendency like with enough adrenaline, you will do all kinds of crazy things. But I literally, when I sat down, I could feel my whole body decompact again because I just grabbed 200 pound shot bags and moved them about, you know, um, uh, only about three or 400 yards. But it was, it was a lot. You know, Secret Service weight. is like, wasn't he taller coming in? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I did feel like I lost like a, a half an inch when I did that, yeah. All right, next question. Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Google Play has a feature that lists, tracks, and remote updates all your Android devices, phones, tablets, TVs, etc. How do you do this similarly with iOS devices? Alex? We set them to auto update and usually let them just do the thing. <laughs> I mean, welcome to iOS. Like we're like the the level of, of of updates on on iOS is most iOS folks just let them go, you know, and uh, and they they update. You decide whether you want to auto update to beta or auto update to regular. Um, I do. I'm starting to pull back on the betas because my phone kept on like there was a beta a, a, about a week ago or two weeks ago where it was just calling people randomly <laughs> and i was like okay this isn't good uh yeah like and and, and so um uh so it, it uh so i I'm, a, I'm backing a little away from that but uh overall we just let our let our machines update except for on our ios devices on my computers i do it very slowly because as you know i stay a year behind or not exactly a year behind but like six to eight months behind i've got almost everything up now to I'm almost, you know, by WWC, all my computers will be updated except for one or two. I always keep a couple back, two or three versions, so that if you have to open something that's older, you can still get to it. Alexander? Yeah, I mean, if you have a lot of devices to manage for businesses, you do need a proper tool for IT purposes to be able to, uh, you know, set specific permissions and roll out updates, that sort of stuff. I believe Apple has their MD, I think it's called MDM uh, for managing a lot of devices. Maybe Jason can correct me there, but I think that's the tool that you'd want to use for this. Jason? Yeah, MDM is is mobile device management. That is what it's called. And the app is called the, um, I believe it's the Apple Configurator. Um, that is, that's actually what it's called. And, and if you want to do this server side, Apple will allow you to do this for, um, in my opinion, a fair bit of money, but probably cheaper than an IT department. It's called, uh, what, Business Pro or Business Express, something like that. I've had to set it up before and it's you know, maybe five, ten bucks per device per month. Next question. Next question comes from Eric Strand in Essex, Connecticut. Can you expand on why plugging a power strip into another power strip is a poor idea? Thank you. Alex? 
It's because you're because the new power strip can create a draw that is much more than one single outlet can handle, or even that other power strip. So what happens is, is if you if you take a you take a let's say a five plug power strip, and each one of those things is pulling, you know, let's say three amps, you know, each. So now you have 15 amps that those are grabbing. That's not a big deal if you're plugging into the wall. If you plug it into another power strip, you're now pulling 15 amps from one outlet. And then you have four more outlets. And so you start adding those outlets to it. And what you what you start do, doing is generating heat, you know. And so it, either that one, if that one has a, a breaker, it will break it because that it says, hey, whoa, I've, you know, you, the next three amps that you add is now pushing it to 18 amps. If it doesn't have a breaker, if it's just a, a cheap, three dollar one that you bought on amazon um, and you plug those in and you extend them you now put three amps into into the first one so now you've got 15 amps on three amps on each one you got 15 amps there the second one now is pulling if you add the 15 plus four more of them you got 27 amps that's coming out of that second that 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 one there so now you're pulling 27 amps from that and 27 amps from the wall and uh, without a breaker and so the wall will either snap off um, if you're lucky, um, but if it gets close, it can just create a lot of heat, you know, and it doesn't, if it doesn't break, you know, and, but typically that'll, that, that can, if you're lucky, that, that's what breakers are designed to do is keep you from putting too much voltage through the wall. Um, and so, but it's, a, it's, it's all kinds of, all kinds of bad. <laughs> so, so and, and again, we also, it's not just that the, that the wall can't handle 15 amps. You're putting 15 amps through one plug and that one, you know, a cheap, power strip pulling 15 amps is going to catch fire then that's that's the thing you worry about chris you know eric i'm sure everything alex just told you is true but i will also say that if it were not for that exact practice i personally would practically be living in the stone age oops oh, hold on i gotta fix something <laughs> well uh chris and, i think you have too and, much resistance and, on your circuit there i'm sorry <laughs> And by the way, Mickey said it was not too much voltage and it's too much current, which I, amps, current. You know, so definitely not. The voltage is all going to be the same. Uh, next question. Edwin R. Ruiz from Chicago is back with another question. In your communal experience, what projection mapping software are you seeing most used for large corporate events? I've seen Resolume used and wanted to know what others are used at the highest levels of production. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, um, the... Uh, uh, Resolume is something we see a lot in the medium to semi-large. And then you, when you get larger, um, there are some specific ones, but Ventus is one we see in Europe a lot. So Ventus, V-E-N-T-U-Z, um, is another one that we see um, done on very large projections across buildings and mapping and, and so on and so forth. But I have to say that those are the only two I've seen um, in quite some time. Next question. Next question comes from Douglas Carmichael's back. Vice Media will be transitioning to a studio model, aka content for hire, and no longer distributing their content on their own. Is this the death knell for investigative journalism online? And he's got a link there. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I I, I know some friends in the Middle East who um, did some did some stuff that ended up on Vice, and based on their comments, uh, I wouldn't consider Vice a investigative uh, journalism. Um, you know, a lot of people were paid to be interviewed and paid to give them information and everything else. So I think that their, their real problem was it was kind of a shock uh, company that wasn't real news. I mean, most news isn't really as real as we think it is, um, but, but Vice was definitely on the outer edge of really going for getting an impact and not getting, and that's part of their problem. There was a lot of other problems that grew too fast and a bunch of other things, but but um, but I think that uh, Vice uh, um, uh, definitely wasn't seen in places that they were reporting about that we don't have a lot of people. They were definitely not seen as the pinnacle of honest <laughs> journalism. So uh, a lot of them, a lot of folks were pretty um, salty about the about them um, in in places like Iraq and stuff like that where I worked. And there's and there's a big cost. Uh, to these media organizations doing their own content. I, uh, I remember uh, working for a publication in a, in a video department for a print media that uh, realized that it was too expensive and they couldn't do it. And so after they realized that they couldn't pay college kids ten, $10 an hour to edit their videos and they had to pay real money, uh, all of a sudden the video department closed down <laughs> and they outsourced it. So um, 
Yeah, that's going to wrap up our first hour. Again, coming up, we've got VLAN. So if you've got questions about virtual local area networks, uh, you can get those into us via Makana or via the QR code. Also, another reminder, tomorrow we have our uh, volunteer meeting. So that's our current volunteer meeting. And if you were at our new volunteer meeting last week, then come on to this one. Saturday is our Q&A show, which is also a practice and training day for some new people. So exciting to see some new faces there. Sunday, as always, is introspection. But uh, I just saw John Wallace and Bo Cordell hop into the panel here. So we're going to see them in just a few moments for all about VLANs. All right, and welcome back to the second hour. So we're talking about VLANs today, virtual local area networks. And so uh, the easiest way that I like to think about this is, let's say that I've got AV over IP, right? I've got something like Dante or NDI sitting on one part of my network. And then I've got another part of my network where here's where all of my normal computers and laptops and everything else live. And then here on the other side, uh, I've got all these Internet of Things devices. I've got a doorbell camera and I've got uh, light bulbs and things like that. Uh, for security reasons, for access control reasons, I don't necessarily want those things to see each other. Now, I could go out and say, well, I'm going to buy three routers and make three Wi-Fis and connect everything. But really what I want to do is to be able to segment my existing network so that I can create a virtual little box for those things to go in. Uh, so this helps with things like traffic prioritization, um, things like quality of service for different uh, members of your network to make sure that things that are sensitive, like your video, let's say if you're doing a video stream or you're doing some sort of broadcast for work and you know that you need X amount of megabits of bandwidth in order to support that, if you put that on its own VLAN, you can reserve a certain amount of bandwidth just for that specific process. Uh, and we've got a great panel here assembled uh, to come in and talk about it. We've got, uh, again, John Wallace and Bo Quarterland here, but also uh, Jason and Alex and Alexander. I mean, I'm just excited. I'm, I'm as much learning about it as a lot of our audience today, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Alexander, why don't you start us off? Yeah, you know, networks are one of the underappreciated things, at least for me over the last few years, I've been trying to make my way through understanding how VLANs work uh, and all that. And it, I met, I went many years completely ignoring my network. And I found, uh, as I'm sure many people here on the panel have found, uh, doing office hours, building up my my studio, adding more pieces of equipment, uh, you know, starting at one computer and now having five computers, you start to realize that you kind of have to pay attention to this stuff a little bit, um, you know, especially when you start doing things like live streaming and making sure that enough bandwidth is allocated to the computer that's live streaming and making sure that other things are not going to conflict with that and take bandwidth from that computer that's live streaming because you don't want that effect that to affect the quality of the stream. So there's a lot of things and I'm still kind of making my way through it. I finally got rid of my consumer grade uh, stuff, uh, moved away from using my ISPs, provided modem. Now I'm using Ubiquiti hardware and I've got a friend that's uh, really knowledgeable about that stuff that's been helping me out. So I'm still trying to understand the differences between, well, specifically actually with VLAN. So this is why I'm really here today to try to learn from everybody on the panel that know, knows a lot more than me about it. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, a lot of times we start to cut up our band, our 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 lands um, pretty quickly <laughs> to make sure that we're protecting uh, bandwidth. So this might be like, for instance, if we're not going to have separate copper for a Dante network, we're going to give it its own VLAN. Um, that it's going to that it, that it it has basically it acts as if it, it's got its own lane and its own bandwidth and its own segmented um, section of that. Um, we also oftentimes build VLANs for guests. So we you know if you're at a location. You want to give everybody a Wi-Fi. We're going to give them something that's all going to live in this little VLAN that has a very limited amount of bandwidth <laughs> that that it can't, so that it 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 lives in that in that world. Um, and so anything they connect to, whether they connect to the Ethernet, whether they connect to, and a lot of times for us in our routers, we can expose that so that um, uh, so that like certain outputs of that router, so certain uh, are are in that VLAN. Um, that Wi-Fi might might be in that VLAN. So no matter what they do to the, in the inside of that section, they they live in this little ten meg pipe or twenty meg pipe, um, and then we have all the other things that we need um, that are that are that have their own pipes that are that are kind of well defined, you know, so that um, we can make sure that works. It's one of the first things that we do when we go to a location is we want to have somebody manage the, the you know, can you set up VLANs for us so that we can segment off our bandwidth for our streams and for our control networks and so on and so forth so that 
Um, you're not, you know, we're not uh, sharing it with someone. So if someone jumps to an FTP site or start, decides to start watching YouTube or, or whatever there, or goes to a Wares site, <laughs> we had, we had, a, I had an event uh, that the stream went down. It wasn't our stream. It was, we were working on something else, but the stream went down and it was because someone, and when we, when it all came down to it, someone was, was downloading and uploading to a Wares site and um, it was sucking up a gig. You know, of, of data because that, you know, is a fast connection. And so those are the kind of things you want to try to protect yourself from is allowing people to just kind of freely use it, not think about it, but have it, um, you know, all those different lines protected. And not only from uh, for protecting yourself from, you know, somebody that's in the background who decides they're going to open up Frame.io and saturate your bandwidth, uh, but also from a security. Sometimes the things that we're transporting uh, are things that are, are embargo that we don't want to get out there or that are our clients content that if it got out that really reflects poorly on us um, but the other thing is if it's a control network you don't want somebody getting in there and messing with your stream when you're live uh, so by if you do need to provide some sort of courtesy wi-fi by segmenting that off uh, you're really protecting yourself uh john um so vlans for me uh especially in the enterprise where i come from um You'd be surprised at how chatty networks are. So if you have a chance, even on your home network, just run Wireshark, put it in promiscuous mode, and just look at all the chatter that's going on. So all the multicast DNS that's happening, all the devices that are looking for each other, all that creates a lot of noise and a lot of potential interference. Uh, so I think of VLANs like uh, concrete dividers on a freeway. So however many lanes you have, so if you got a 10-lane freeway, uh, you can put up that concrete divider. Now you're allowing it so the cars that are going north and south, the south cars can't hit the north cars, and you're just providing some rails for things to operate within. It's really important to start understanding what's chatty, what's having issues, what kind of devices are really sensitive to those types of things. And even in like, I've, I've done a bunch of work in manufacturing facilities, the network cards in those devices, they're terrible. They're spinning out garbage. And so like PLC networks, we want to completely separate from anything. The devices that people, you know, don't think about that uh, they're just throwing in a network because you want to be able to send a quick command to it over like an RS-232 over Ethernet. Those are the types of things that you really want to start understanding, segmenting, and then obviously for security as well. So really think about the types of equipment that you're using, what the purpose is for it, and then start segmenting your network that way. And then, uh, Bo, I think you mentioned that you actually have one of the uh, M4250 switches with the web GUI that you were going to walk us a little bit through. Do you have that uh, that you could show us? Yeah, I can pull that up in just a minute. Um, but I was just going to say, like, for, for me, I think we all get, we all back into VLANs, uh, you know, in, in a certain way. And for me, and probably for a lot of you, it's because something failed. Like, there, there's a reason, you know, we ran up against the limit. And it's like, okay, now we have to figure out, you know, how do we get past this? And, you know, I mean, you all, we all start with like dumb switches, right? Um, until you outgrow that. And then you realize, like for me, it was KVMs. KVMs brought down my network because uh, I had a lot of data, you know, a lot of computers plugged into a network. And then I had some IP based KVMs, uh, these adder XDIPs. Um, these KVMs, once you connect two, two user stations to the same computer, it uh, switches from unicast to multicast. And that completely, uh, completely trashed our, our dumb Netgear switches. And I mean, everything just would, would go, you and know, it's funny, stop working. Multicast is something that, you know, a lot of us people will say, why don't people just do more multicast with their video and talk to IT folks about that? <laughs> they're not, they're usually like, uh, no, thank you. You know, like, no, thank you. Or, or you know, or that they're going to spend a lot of time doing exactly what you're talking about, which is, you know, setting up proper VLANs to allow that to happen in its own little world. And then for, to, in order to make any of these VLANs happen, it's important to note that this isn't something that your off-the-shelf router that you got with your internet connection is likely able to do. Um, it's got to it's got to support uh, .1Q or uh, 802.1Q in order to be able to assign VLAN tags to the specific packets and to the data that's flowing through certain ports. But Bo, sorry, you had more to say. Yeah, no, so that's that's great. And the the, the thing that you know, it took me a little while to get over the hump uh, from going from like the dumb switch based workflow to to understanding VLANs. Um, you know, but VLANs is essentially just dividing up a router or sorry, dividing up a switch into you know, I mean, you can essentially think of it as dividing up a big, bigger switch into, you know, a couple of dumb switches. 
So if, if these four ports are on the same VLAN and these four ports are on the same VLAN, it's the exact same as having two dumb switches sitting side by side, um, more or less, right? So, and it's a and it's an at the Ethernet level, so it's vendor agnostic. It's it's literally a number that gets added to the Ethernet protocol. Uh, and I think you can have VLANs like one through four hundred and ninety three. Somebody can correct me, uh, ninety six maybe. Um, and and literally, it's like it, every switch that, uh, like CJ said, uh, that that is managed enough to understand VLANs will respect. If it's VLAN ten on this switch, it'll come in as VLAN ten on the other switch. So yeah, whenever uh, you know, we can go through some other guys and then and then do you have take to look at Bo, how do you have out. to at the very end of that chain? Do you have to strip that VLAN tag out? Does that ever cause issues, or is it so, or if it's there, do people just ignore it if they don't support eight hundred two one Q? John or somebody can correct me if yeah, I'm wrong. So, but basically, yeah, go ahead. As long as you are um, not trunking the port, so you no mm-hmm. longer need that tag. It, it is no longer required. So it'll get dropped by the switch. Um, so the only thing is when you're combining multiple VLANs into a trunk port, that's when you need to carry them all. I mean, you're tagging on the other side to say you're a part of this port group. And so when you say trunking, again, just to clarify, you're taking, uh, uh, let's say you've got port one on your switch and then you've got VLAN tag one, VLAN tag 15, VLAN tag 200. All th- data from all three of those VLANs are flowing through one trunk or one single port. And then on the other side, the receiving end has to be able to parse those VLAN uh, ID tags so that they can still keep the network segmentation. That's correct. Yeah. So what you're doing is over one piece of cable or a pair of them for redundancy, you can bring multiple networks into another switch. I mean, you can segment that switch on the other side. Uh, so I know like pa- Paul Wallace had a question uh, earlier in the week about how would he uh, connect on the far side uh, uh, a router. Uh, that would be able to par- participate in the failover. That's the same type of thing. So that same cable that's carrying it over, he can then plug in, create another VLAN, and then extend that into the WAN port on the, on his UDM router. And it's just the same t- type of technology. And 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 just a question there. So what you're talking about with the trunking, though, is you you say let's say we grab, um, you you have four VLANs. You create four VLANs. You trunk it from one to the next. Um, from, you know, just one Ethernet connection to that that next one. But when it gets to the next one, you take each one of those and put them, you could potentially, I mean, you could just serve them up, but you could also potentially put them on each, on a, on a different Ethernet output for each one, different port. Um, yeah, so let's say you're running from, you know, port one to port one on, on switch to switch, and you're carrying port, you know, VLANs 10, 11, 12, and 13. Yeah. Now, port one on both sides is tagged with that, and there's mm-hmm. going to be a native VLAN that you can put things on the rest of those. So let's say the other seven ports that are available on that far end switch, you would assign the native VLAN, and then it would be able to communicate there uh, across those different. So VLAN 12 on port two and VLAN 14 on port three, and right. then those networks would be extended. So what you're doing is extending that layer two domain across those those ports, and then you're you're trunking it, so you're pushing all that bandwidth and networking into a port across mm-hmm. of each other. So and and so it, it would be like something like you would have, you've, let's say you have four going in here. Well, let's say it's eight, right? So but you have four four of them are there, but we have one. Ah, let me do this again. Sorry, I hit the button wrong. So we have this here, and we've got let's say four ports going in here that those are native, so those are all on their own VLAN. I just want to make sure I understand this. And then, mm-hmm. but we're connecting port one to port one here, right? So that those are connected between those and that can be any distance. In, in fact, it could be trunk between two different v- venues, right? I mean, if, yep. it's, if you build that out. And then this one has its own um, over here. It's got the same four that were, you know, now it can have those those here, but that traffic between those are being is being connected by this one trunk that's carrying all four of these. That's right? correct. And then it and then it's being pushed back out to these here. Okay, yeah, it's cool. Now consumer routers will try to do a little bit of segmentation, like even the old Apple airports used to have, um, you know, uh, MAC address level access control lists, and they'll do guest networks and things that to try to segment the network. That's kind of the consumer way to try to get this idea, but it's not quite the same thing. Is that right? Uh, uh, a guest network typically would be a separate VLAN. Um, they're, just, they're hiding it behind a GUI. They're making right. it friendly, not using networking terms. Exactly. Uh, but when you start talking about like 
actual traffic prioritization, that's more QoS than it is VLANs. You're not getting bandwidth allocation via um essentially what you're doing is tagging a VLAN to have a certain priority. Um, and that's part of the QoS protocol, not really a part of VLANs uh, as a whole. And then when, and Alex, you mentioned something about connecting uh, connecting two switches that might be at two different venues uh, and then using VLANs at both of those. Are you requ- are you then incorporating a VPN into the mix to, to yeah. connect those two over the I mean, distance? That's a, and typically, that's a VPN. It doesn't have to be. I, th- yeah, I believe you can do port forwarding as well. But but the um, but typically, we're using a a, a v um, a v, um, uh, VNC to, to um, the. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting, getting all these things together there. But um, the alphabet but soup we, today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, we use the VPN to connect the two of them together and. Typically, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. In the last 15 years, I've mostly used Meraki's for that because the cloud management of that is so easy. You know, it's expensive, uh, so it's kind of like the Cadillac of you know, you can do it with ubiquity. You can do you can do it with Raspberry Pis. You know, like you can do a lot of things there. It's just how much creature comfort do you want when you're putting those things together? And so, when you want the, in my opinion, the most creature comfort at the highest expense. Um, has been Meraki, which is that we're, you know, and so it's got this great cloud infrastructure. I can see every every device that has MDM on it. I can see where the, they all are. I can even take them over if I want to. But I, but most importantly, I can connect my, these routers, they all connect into that cloud and I can be passing information back and forth as if it was local. So for us, you know, the networks that we have, the, the trunking that was just talked about where, you know, I can have these networks that I'm jumping onto inside of you know if i'm in a in a ho- in one location and the way we the way to think about this and the way we've used it in the past for vpns and it's probably a whole nother hour on vpns but but the um but that we would have uh, a remote box and that remote box has you know all the items that can do dhcp are just left to dhcp so we don't try to we don't want to put um ips on all of them they're all um they all have reservations inside of that router and that router says, oh, I know what that, by the MAC address, I know what that is, and I'm going to give it this. But it means that all of our switchers are 10, you know, it's like 10.1.2.50. <laughs> and so that 50 is the route, is the switcher. The two is the, is typically the, the, uh, is the remote, you know, the remote network, right? And three is another network somewhere else, but they're all inside of that space. And so I can jump to those and, and, and get to them. And so through a mixture of VPN and then inside of that router, all of those machines are living in their own VLAN. The encoders are living in, in their own, oftentimes in their own VLAN. You know, and and sometimes you get into a complicated thing where the controls for something are going into one MAC address that is in one VLAN. The output of it is going to another MAC address that's another VLAN. Um, you know, so that they, you know, all that stuff stays set. So you might have one computer sitting on two different different VLANs. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to Bo now because uh, you have the Netgear the 4250 their their AV line switch and you've actually have a little bit of the GUI to to show us how that's configured. I do. So I've been living in this world a lot uh, the past ten days. So picture this. So I have essentially two racks. They're going to be at the same venue. I'm building kits for for a deployment we have this summer. So I've got a rack and a rack room that's going to have a uh, edge router that's going to be my router that brings the internet in. And then it's going to deploy, you know, it's going to provide my DHCP, uh, like Alex was talking about, to all my devices. Um, so I have my edge router, and then I have it sitting on top of, of a 30-port uh, Netgear model, you know, M4250, all right? And then I have one fiber connecting that rack to my operator station, which is going to be three, four, five hundred 500 meters away, all right? And in that rack, that one fiber plugs in to another Netgear switch, and then uh, farms all of those VLANs back out to the, it's a 12 port, 13 port switch, I think. So let's, let's show you kind of how that's set up. Uh, so this is my management interface for the edge router. <clears throat> so I've got my WAN coming in and I've made it VLAN aware. So on the switch, the switch side of the router, I've added a VLAN 10 and a VLAN 11. So for me, VLAN 10 is my con- command and control VLAN and v- VLAN 11 is my uh, KVM VLAN. So Alex, forgive me for not having my Telestrator uh, today, but I've configured, <laughs> I've configured uh, DHCP servers on those two VLANs to hand out DHCP addresses. So I kind of use uh, the the second octet twenty four is my the kind of the kit ID, 
And then the third octet is the VLAN for me. That's kind of how I keep it straight. So if I see a device that has a VLAN 11, but it's not a KV, or sorry, if I see a device that has an IP address of a dot 11, but it's not a KVM device, I know I've plugged it into the wrong spot. So it kind of helps with segmentation, uh, subnet segmentation as well. Now, this is my first switch. So I've got uh, 30 ports here. My edge router is plugged into port 25. And you can see, if you can see on the pop-up that it's VLAN ID, it carries VLANs 1, 10, and 11. So one's like the default VLAN. If it's kind of, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's default for pretty much everything um, out of the box. So you generally don't want to use one on purpose. You, you, at least the way I've been taught, you try to stay away from using one unless you have a reason to. So in the net gear, you configure your VLAN. So I have three configured profiles, just the default. I have a ROS command and control network and a ROS KVM network. Uh, if I go to network profiles, this is where you can actually configure those profiles. And you know why the reason everybody loves the Netgear stuff so much in the AV world is they have a lot of these profile templates. So they've worked with Audinate, they've worked with uh, uh, you know the NDI people, uh, New Tech, and they've kind of created profiles to give you kind of templates to start a VPN or a, and you're uh, and you're applying that to VLAN. it. So you're saying this is a VLAN, and in this VLAN, I am uh, using this template. Is that right? Yeah, essentially, you're saying, hey, this this you know. In this VLAN, I'm going to be using video, so I'm going to start with this VLAN. So I'm going to, you know, use using that template, and then you can adjust the parameters if you want. Like, but but out of the box, a video template is going to give you multicast awareness. It's going to figure out all the IGMP stuff and the querier and all the stuff you need for multicast. So that's built into the video template. It's not built into the data template, right? So that's kind of your starting point. And then once you've got that going, you essentially give it the ID, and the VLAN ID is, is like I say, it's uh, vendor agnostic. I have uh, a couple of S FS switches and some other things that you know work with this just as well. Um, but if I go in here and I edit that VLAN, then this is where I'm literally applying that VLAN to certain ports of the switch, right? So uh, I've got... The checkbox in Netgear World means that uh, that port is an access port for this VLAN. So if you plug a computer into it or something that's not really VLAN aware, then that's the VLAN that this is that's going to come out of this port. Okay. So if you click the like I just clicked port three, a T showed up. So that just applied this as a trunk on port three. So it's not the native VLAN for port three anymore. So if you plug a computer up to it that's not VLAN aware, it's not going to take out VLAN 10. It's probably going to live on VLAN 1. Um, but that just turned that into a trunk port. Or I can click it again, and that VLAN is nowhere to be found on port three. So now, if you're plugged into port three, you cannot access VLAN 10, right? So generally what I do is for, for my things, like I say, I have two VLANs. If I was also doing Dante and NDI, I would probably have another, you know, uh, one or two VLANs for those. But I use command and control, and then I have KVM. So on this switch, I literally have everything set up as an access port for my command and control, so I can just plug computers up to it, except for the six ports that I have for uh, VLAN. So that's where you can see up here, Netgear actually lets you color code it. So blue is my data uh, VLAN, and yellow is my KVM VLAN. Um, and then on this one, you see there's an A, the, the neck gear, there's, there's kind of a bug here where it's a, doing an auto trunk thing for my SFP ports. Uh, you can see it better here, but you can see that ports uh, 10, 11, and 12 on my 12 port switch are trunk ports. So those ports are carrying all of the traffic down one, so, Literally, port eleven here on this switch, and and, is and this connected. is a, how many ports is in this in this router in the in the forty two fifty. So you're looking at two two different routers. So this is my main router, so or this is my main switch. It's thirty ports. Oh, it's a okay. switch. It's a switch. Yep. Okay. So this is a thirty port switch, and then mm -hmm. this this GUI is a my 
my operator station switch, which is only 12 ports. So I have one fiber connecting port 27 on this switch, the big switch, to port 11 on the small switch. Right. All right. And those are 10 gig ports. Okay. So um, the SFP ports on the on on the particular models that I have of the Netgear switch are SFP ports. So meaning you can you know SFP. I think it's small form pluggable. So you can get all kind of SFPs. But these are available. You can on these switches you can plug in 10 gig SFPs. So mm -hmm. I have uh, this is a Cat six SFP. So you could literally just and use it's 10 a gigs. Cat the six cable. Is but the it would highest. be 10 gigs. Is it yeah. 10 the highest? For SFP on these plus, switches, yes. For the SFPs. For SFP plus, correct. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but this is like I say, this is a bidirectional uh, SFP. So it's one fiber for transmit and receive. Um, and it just plugs into the SFP port, and that's how you combine. It, it, we just made it a trunk port, so that's how it's combining all of my VLANs onto that one fiber. And like right. you say, like your your diagram, Alex, you saw where you had you know four or five things coming in this way, four or five things plugging in over here, and it's connected over that one fiber. Well, that's why generally you're going to want that to be a a fatter bandwidth link. So right. you know, especially I'm dealing with KVMs. Sometimes they're uncompressed. Sometimes you're pushing. I might be pushing more than a gigabit down one VLAN. So that 10 gig link makes sure that I have enough pipe between the two switches to do everything I need to do. Yeah. And we have some switches that are higher than that. That's why I was asking, you know, some of the Cisco yep. switches yep. that we use mm -hmm. are like 40, I think 40. I have yeah, 25, 40, use. yeah, 80, 48. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jason, you had some stuff to throw in. I mean, I, I'm... If we have time for it, sure. I mean, I, I built one of these just last night, and here's another example of basically the same thing. So, you know, the red ports in this case are NDI and Dante, um, and the the kind of lime green ones are for sure device control and Dante. And like, you know, the, the really nice thing about uh, um, the Netgear switches when you're playing around with VLANs is they combine them. So like, you know, if, if you want this and Dante or, or if you want Dante as its own thing or if you want Dante to traverse with the two, um, this is how you get, you know, these permutations and combinations that I, I know at first seem complicated, but really what it is is just um, the ultimate level of control. So, you know, for example, if you want DHCP on uh, on one VLAN and then absolutely nothing on the other VLAN. In this case, let's see, the black, um, no, there it is. The black port is, you know, it's the data port and I was in the middle of setting this up, 169.254, you know, dual 100s. And um, that had no DHCP at all. Um, you know, you would have to actually set up your own static just to connect to it. If not, it would just simply drop. That is a feature, not a bug. Um, you know, think of it like ultimate control. And if you don't understand what you're doing, you, yeah, you can get in trouble, but you know, it's nothing more, nothing worse than a reset. Alexander. I understand why we need VLANs for separation of traffic. I'm not sure I under, here's the thing I can't really wrap my head around. So if you have two VLANs, uh, for example, if I still, let's say I have my ATEM switcher on one VLAN that's separate, but I still need to be able to access it. Now, if my main computer is on one VLAN, how does it access another VLAN when that traffic is separate? I'm not sure, sure conceptually I understand that. You just open ports, I believe, um, distinctly between the VLAN. Nope, John's saying no. I guess I'm wrong. You can go ahead, John. Yeah, so if you're talking across uh, two devices that are in two different network segments, what has to happen is the VLAN is going to have something called an ACL, an access control list. Network guys are going to call them ACLs. You know, it's, we're, we're nerds. So, <laughs> uh, and you're going to have to have a router. Uh, so anytime you're going to cross a layer two segment, meaning like the, the 10, 12, 11, and 10, 12, 10 that uh, Bo Cordell was talking about, those are two different subnets. And so in order to cross and talk against two different subnets, you have to talk to a router. And so when you start doing that, and then you have controls, the ACLs, that actually tell you I'm allowed to or I'm not allowed to talk to it. And that's happening at layer two. 
And then once you start getting into uh, more controls, a, a layer three or layer four firewall, you can even start layering stuff on top of that and start doing rules based upon ports like uh, Jason was talking about. But that's happening at a much higher level. And then you start getting into like what you're seeing with most corporations, layer seven, where they're looking at the traffic that's coming in and making decisions off of that. So it just gets smarter and smarter as you move up the chain of the OSI layer. Well, you have some questions stacking up, so let's jump right into those. Alexander? Yeah, absolutely. So Ronnie Hoffsoe from Trump Sunoe asks, can we also discuss pros, cons using VLAN in a cloud computing scenario like AWS? Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this really is for your own sanity. Think of, you know, think back to your old home, you know, Wi-Fi router, the guest router example. You know, I want guest Wi-Fi and guest Wi-Fi can't access my printer and they can't see what else is on the network. The same thing here. It's like if I throw it in the bucket, then, you know, the cloud can see it. And if I don't, then it can't. And that by default is, again, a feature. Go ahead, John. Yeah, in the AWS world, or really in the Azure world, you're like dealing with VNets. And so what you're doing is establishing those relationships of what can talk to what across those networks. Um, and then you, you can even start getting into firewalls. You can start getting into load balancers of how you actually facilitate the transfer between those two VNets. Uh, and that's really kind of how you start breaking that down. It is a very similar concept. It's just implemented a different way because you could literally be talking to one data center to another. It doesn't necessarily have to be devices that are physically close to each other. Next question. Next question comes from Jeff Hedberg in New York. Once you have segmented all items into their own VLANs, how would you configure a way for one machine to be able to access any and all of the VLANs so that you are able to manage any of the separated devices using SSH slash VNC slash RDP, for example? Go ahead, John. So again, that, that comes into the the ACLs, the ACLs, the access control list that you have to set up. That's how you're starting to, at a basic level, determine what can talk to what. And once you start layering security on top of that, you can start configuring firewalls to say like, hey, a port base, this is what's going to happen here. Here's who can talk to here. And then you can start routing into uh, black holes. So you can say nothing from this network can talk to anything in this network. Uh, so you, that's how you start basic. Uh, you know, we want to dig in further. We can definitely talk in after hours. Next question. Robert Sabavati in Poland asks, can the panel discuss VLANs in the context of security, i.e. protecting a, a NAS to access from outside the network and a separate backup device for the NAS? Go ahead, Jason. I'm not going to use your examples, but I'm going to use one that, that comes to mind. Um, if you have a really cheap IoT device and you just don't want it to be able to chat somewhere, um, you can restrict it, right? You could restrict it even to the the um, what it can dial out to. Let's say I have a HomeKit thing, but I don't quite trust it, and I want it to be able to talk only through the CNC that is part of HomeKit. Absolutely easy, piece of cake, and like you know that that is a perfect example of how you can just kind of drop it in a bucket and then forget about it. And the other thing that I was thinking about is uh, just in terms of a, of a guest network, really, uh, a lot of routers come with a guest network. But when I have people over and I'm going to give them access to my Wi-Fi because they want to stream or whatever, I want to make sure that just because they're on the Internet doesn't mean that they can see all of my network attached storage and all of the HomeKit devices and they don't have anything. I don't know if they even have inadvertently installed something that's going to get chatty and start to see things that are on my network. So it's a, there's a lot of, uh, the thing that most, I was almost bummed because I'm like, ah, I want to do this right now, but I don't have the gear for it because the security is just awesome. Uh, John? Yeah, the, the NAS access from outside the network, that's really outside of VLANs. That's more of a firewall play. And so really once you want to start understanding is like when to use what. Like the guest network is a perfect use case for that. As, and then also, Think about things you would want to maybe share right across that. So do I want my guests to be able to use Apple TV and be able to screen share? And so now I'm going to segment maybe all of my devices that I want to share across both into their own VLAN. And then both of those networks have access to each other. But my device, you know, my computer with all my finance information, I don't want that talking to the guest network at all. I don't want that discoverable. That's how you're creating that segmentation across those multiple devices. Bo? 
I'm probably not the only one on the panel who uh, went down this rabbit hole with VLANs in a home network using Ubiquity stuff. And man, it's going to be so awesome. I'm going to black hole all of my uh, IoT devices and not let them talk to anything locally. And then uh, your Sonos's don't work, your Apple T's don't work, your Apple TV's don't work, your wife's uh, can't connect on her Zoom, and suddenly you're back to a flat, like, dumb Wi-Fi network. So just be careful. It's a bit of a red red pill, blue pill situation uh, once you start going down this rabbit hole at home. And what are you using for as a router on top of the switches? Uh, so in my, so I've done the Ubiquity Dream Machines at home. I've I've kind of defaulted back to the uh, Ubiquity Edge routers. Uh, the Edge Router X SFP has an SFP. The Edge Router uh, X just has four ports. It's just a it's a simple router. It and it does routing really good. It doesn't have Wi-Fi built in. It doesn't have any of the. It's not a really pretty GUI. Um, it's just a solid router. Uh, now when you start trying to route between VLANs and you know. Um, starting to to d- deal with the ACLs and and all of the complex stuff, that's where you know I start to get in over my head and and trying to get all the MDNS stuff working for Sonos devices to work across VLANs and just be careful. It's it's a slippery slope at home. If you're going to go down this road and you think you need an afternoon, you should just book the whole weekend for it because you don't <laughs> just, know what you don't know. Go ahead and stand up a, uh, a a dumb Linksys box that you've gotten you've had in the closet for ten years and put your wife's stuff on that box, and then you test on uh, on the the dev. Don't test on prod. Go ahead, John. <laughs> That's another thing I I started using recently is uh, Juniper Mists. Uh, if you haven't checked them out, they're a very strong competitor to the Meraki stuff. They step above in price when it comes to Ubiquity, so they're a little bit more expensive. But um, they have some really great features, especially for managing quick install networks, where they're actually able to like tell you if a cable is going bad. They can tell you if a DNS is going bad. I and mean, they have a natural la- language like uh, search that you can actually type in and say, how many people are connected to this? Is there any bad cables? Is there any, like You can just ask its AI this these questions and really dig in uh so it's a really cool interesting tool they just released a new uh feature set just a little bit ago um we just started deploying them for some broker shops we're working with so it's been really interesting to see and and kind of opening my eyes to the next kind of thing that's coming down the pipe uh meraki is definitely interested in, in a little it's it came out from the the creator of meraki went to juniper and then started building this, and then HPE just bought Juniper, so we'll see kind of what happens. I'm I'm afraid anytime a large organization that doesn't innovate just buys things, you know, a la Cisco. So uh, we'll see where it goes, but right now it's definitely an interesting tool, and it's definitely pushing the industry forward. And regardless of the the specific hardware and the specific gear that you're using, as you're getting this set up and as you're configuring it, whether it's in your home or in your production and your business, save yourself the time and export when you get it working export the configuration settings and version it so that way as you keep tweaking and keep playing and you're changing variables you at least can roll back to a something that's working in an instant if you had to and uh, and when you make changes you know have good documentation next question Douglas Carmichael is back. What tools can be effective for routing slash firewalling between VLANs? Would there be switches that can do that natively? Go ahead John. Yeah, so there's two types of switches, right? So you have a layer two switch. Those operate uh, within a MAC address only. And then you can start getting into layer three switches. And those ones are essentially, they are routers. They may not have all the functionality of a dedicated router, but they're going to be able to provide that basic functionality uh, that we talked about, the ACLs, the routing between different networks. All that's happening at layer three. Uh, So that's definitely a good place to start. Next question. Next question is from me. Have you ever seen DMX lighting devices that use ArtNet create problems? I've heard the protocol is very chatty. Should your DMX protocol lighting be on a VLAN? Go ahead, John. I have always segmented uh, my production devices uh, into the different functional groups. Uh, it makes sense for me. It's also better you know, secure. Uh, one of the things I always do is I just delete VLAN 1. Uh, so anytime VLAN 1 is out there, you're able to hop between them. So like on a, my Mac or my Windows device, I can type in whatever VLAN I want and just jump if VLAN 1 is the native VLAN. So just be aware of that uh, from a security aspect. And as well as just, I, I have not noticed any issues with DMX if I have a couple small things, but 
I always just want to make sure I'm setting myself up for the best success. I want to isolate problems. So I don't want Dante causing an issue with, with uh, DMX. I, I want to know if I'm having a DMX issue, it's only affecting DMX. You know what I mean? So when you're dealing with productions, especially, or, or workplaces, enterprises, whatever you're dealing with, isolate your domain. So when you're troubleshooting, it's a lot easier to figure out what's going wrong. And Jason? Yeah, and along those lines, in fact, there's a good analogy here, right? As productions are small, you know, you can have one or two people doing a whole bunch of things. Think of that like, you know, just one router and like everyone's just kind of, it's a party. When you get into larger productions, you need departments and those departments need their own rules and their own protocols. That's kind of what a VLAN is. Next question. Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas asks, my AT&T wireless hotspot isn't working on my Ubiquiti VLAN. Is there a better wireless hotspot that I could use for failover when my primary cable network goes down? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, well, Paul, you know, yesterday AT&T had one of the largest cellular out outages in their history. Um, but my immediate thought here is, you know... <sighs> Uh, if you're using a hotspot, a hotspot is a gateway, a cellular modem, and a router built in. My guess is you're double natting, and um, and the router isn't actually being able to pick up that bandwidth, and um, and it's, it's not actually the uh, the device. I think it's the user in this case. I think you need to just strip down the router and put it straight in through. And so that would be putting the the wireless hotspot or the router into bridge mode because the hotspot um, is doing the DHCP. Um, well, no, I'm sorry. The other way around. Uh, you want to turn off the router on the hotspot and essentially give the access to the um, to your so, actual so the hotspot router to your WAN ubiquity. into the. Got That's it. right. So right, you have ahead, a Alex. true RIT. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, when we're what we've used in the past are pep links. You know, for these. I mean, to to take um, you can take multiple cellular connections. They, they'll take their own SIMs. Um, and you can connect those all to the pep link. It takes a little bit to register them nowadays. Um, it's hard to get SIMs outside of the MiFi's in the United States, but you can. You just have to take on take on the one year or whatever that they want to do with those. Um, anyway, but but you get three or four of them. Uh, I would recommend not getting multiples of uh, multiple cells from the same uh, provider. So we've done ones where oh we'll get three from Verizon or whatever. And Verizon gets wise to that pretty quickly and will not let you um, make that work. <laughs> I, I don't know about everybody, but I can tell you Verizon does it. Uh, so splitting those up, so you're going to get a T-Mobile and an AT&T and, and a Verizon, you're going to put them in there um, and then have those provide that bonded um, solution back to your to your router. Next question. We're going to switch. Router. All right, another question from me. When do you decide to create a VLAN versus just putting a piece of hardware on a separate WAN? John? Uh Here's the thing. Do you want to manage 100 different devices or do you want to set up 100 VLANs and manage a couple of devices? That's really what you're getting into. Can you do it this way? 100%. Would I want to manage that? You know, I could also put a switch at every desk run I have in my office, but then I'm managing it in a way different way. And it's a much more uh, manual process for me to, to go about and I can't centrally control and provide access to. So that's that's the, the, the way to I tackle it and handle it. Bo? Oh, can't hear you, Bo. Answering a slightly different question. A lot of times, you know, I'm standing up temporary networks that are going to be there for, you know, a couple a couple days, a couple weeks. Um, and, and most of the people operating the kits are not network engineers. So if, if I'm handed a network that is, you know, a stat feed from a specific sport, you know, I could I could throw them on one of my VLANs and I could, you know, implement that and, and make that all work on all of my computers and 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 do the routing at the at the router level between VLANs to get it to the machines that it needs to go to. Or I can put it on a separate NIC on the machine that it needs. So normally I keep them physically separate, just put it literally on a separate NIC and don't even you know, don't even throw it into my infrastructure unless I have to. Alex? Yeah, and almost all the time we use VLANs, but there have been times when we separate things with copper. And the reason we do that typically is to make it keep it simple and to reduce the number of variables that we have. It's more variables in the sense that there's lots of little bits and pieces, but if we see everything, we're not worried about things getting crowded or things, someone changing something on the back end and taking apart our Dante network. Typically, the, the only one that we've that I've really done this with where we separate it with copper is Dante. <laughs> so it's, uh, which uh, we found to be very uh, um 
sensitive, you know? And so, so we, uh, so we've, we've, we've um, sometimes done that. It, like when I build a permanent network, I know that we uh, built a separate piece of copper, you know, I and mean, we just have it all on its own line and it's all its own switches and everything else. And it's not that you can't do it another way. It's just that we found that that never breaks, <laughs> like, you know, in that, and we haven't done it recently. I did it with my old studio, but we just found that that always worked. And, um, and we had lots of little Dante issues until we did that. Bo, you had one more thing? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, w when it comes to Dante and, and, and um, <clears throat> you know, any sort of audio over IP situation, a lot of times people don't want you to plug into their Dante, Dante network. Uh, and we run into that a lot. When you literally, they will take their Dante network and they'll pop a Rio or, you know, a, a box there and they'll convert everything to analog. And you'll have your Rio bring it back from analog onto your Dante network, keep your two Dante networks separate uh, and literally connecting it with XLRs in the middle. And, but that's, and that's the only way to make sure that nobody's going to point fingers when their network goes down and blame you for it, you know? Right. And and that's also a clocking thing too. Like that, right. we do that for both both reasons. We And we do that too. We set them in a concert where we have whole bunch of outputs and put them all into a Rio. It seems stupid when you're doing it, but it doesn't seem as stupid because you feel like you should be, it should be able to work, but then you have clicking and all kinds of other stuff on your other end. It might be stupid, but it's safe. Uh, it John? Uh, there's two metrics that you should really pay attention to. That's the switching back plane capacity and your packets per second. And so once you start exceeding, so if you think about uh, like you have, let's say you have 48 ports on a, a router and it's 48 one gig ports, but you may only have 30 gigs of backplane capacity. And so you can actually saturate that router without even filling up a full router and sending that data across. So really pay attention to that. I'm sorry, on the switch. And on a router side, it's really measured in how many packets can be processed per second. And so really start to understand that and look at that is when you're understanding if you're starting to have issues, look at how much bandwidth you're using across that device and how much packets are being processed and really start to understand what well, the throughput cap cap capacity of that. You'll see it on the, especially on the ubiquity, the low end side, they really cut corners on that package per second and the, the backplane capacity. And once you override that, that's when you start having everything fall apart. Next question. Uh, next question comes from us uh, from T uh, Laura Thompson in Beaumont, Texas. Can you explain the difference between a VLAN and a VPN? Go ahead, John. Yeah, so a VLAN is a network segmented virtually. So instead of having two different switches that are completely segmented, you're uh, allowing them to layer over top of each other and share that. I mean, um, if you're familiar at all with like hypervisors or VMware Hyper-V, it's the same concept where you're layering technology and sharing that infrastructure to have two, two different purposes. Whereas a VPN is a, is a virtual link between two devices. So you can extend that layer two domain across a WAN or across a multiple layer three segments. Um, so that's, that's basically the difference. Next question. Question for me, do SFP adapters have active circuitry to convert the cat cable to optical transmission? Uh, go ahead, Jason. Um, you know, kind of. So yes, there is active circuitry and um, the SFP plugs into the switch and there are lots of different ways this can be. So there are tens and there are 100s and there are large ones and small ones and you can convert SFP into ethernet or you can, um, for, for longer runs or, you know, if you want it to really work well, um, you will trans, you, you'll switch it over to fiber and you'll convert from SFP to fiber. John? Yeah, and as you see, if Jason, if you want to pull that picture back up, what you'll notice is that there is a, like a, on the bottom of the one, the fiber one that he has, there's that 300M. That's the max distance that SFP will support. And so uh, on the copper ones that about Bo showed earlier that can do 10 gig over copper, those are usually a lot limited versus what the typical port is. So you can't run that more than like, 50 meters, where you can run a standard Ethernet cable 100 meters, the power draw of that is going to limit how much range that has. So really pay attention to that. If you're using SFP ports to convert to copper, fiber 300 meters is, is pretty long. You're most likely not going to run into an issue there, but definitely on the copper side, pay attention to that. And Bo? Yeah, I would, I would answer it slightly differently. Um, the switch or, or whatever, the SFP port itself is going to be electrical. So then the SFP is going to convert electrical to optical. Um, it's going to be electrical in the in the switch or in the, this is a media converter that just 
has one one in one out. Um, but the SFP is what converts the electrical to optical. Um, like John was saying, this uh, so the Cat Six SFP I have literally says thirty meters, ten gig, and then this one is ten kilometers. So you can do a lot further over fiber for sure. All right, next question. Well, Cordell from Charleston, South Carolina asks, how do you monitor your networks to know what's going on within them? I love an intra-panel question. Go ahead, John. Uh, Orion SolarWinds is a really good product. I know they had some security issues uh, last year or two years ago, uh, but they're a solid product. Um, NetFlow is also your friend. And if you have anything like Meraki's dashboard, the Juniper dashboard, even the, what Ubiquity offers as far as the dashboard will provide you a lot of insight into what's talking to what, how much bandwidth is being used. Uh, but NetFlow is definitely the biggest thing I use on my campus to understand what is happening at my network at any point in time. Go ahead, Bo. I've gone pretty far down the rabbit hole of, uh, of SNMP and Grafana and, and Prometheus and uh, polling my devices for data. So this is, I, I just stood this network up this week. I don't have a great dashboard to show you, but essentially using uh, Prometheus to pull the switches and the routers, you can literally look and see kind of what's happening across your entire network, uh, like bandwidth in, bandwidth out, all that kind of thing. So where this really helped me in the past is to make sure that my VLANs, like for instance, my KVM VLAN, I don't want that traffic to ever go through my router because the the link into my router is only a one gig link. The link between my switches are 10 gigs. So I don't want my VLAN traffic to ever hit my router and my router to have to make the decision on where to send that traffic, right? So using using the tools in, in Grafana, I'm able to kind of drill down into my data and actually see like, okay, what's actually hitting my uh, my router port? And it's only, you know, it's, it's, it's a couple of kilobits. Whereas my... KVM ports are 20, 30 megabits. So I know that my traffic is not going through, uh, you know, it's not getting up to the router. So you can drill down. The good thing about um, Prometheus is it's a time series database. You can actually go back. If you've had this up for a while, you can actually go back and see, hey, last Wednesday, you know, what was going on with my network when when we there was a, a reported issue? Um, so it's it's kind of across all vendors. So it's not like logging into your Meraki where you can only see your Meraki stuff. Uh, you're able to, to really look across your entire network. And that's where having that log, if you had a production that had a glitch or a blip and you can pinpoint that point in time, you can go back into the history and say, what was occurring at the network during this time? Because if you don't have that data, it's really kind of a, you're shooting in the dark to try and figure out what was going on at that time. It's another rabbit hole that I've spent a lot of time on. And, and uh, Grafana has tools where you can do um, like syslogs, so you can send all of your your machine logs and all your network logs and uh, any sort of log, and you can literally drill down into a certain time frame and see what all your machines were doing. You know, you can see that your CPU had spiked to eighty percent during that time. It's there, it's really powerful once you uh, get into to instrumenting your entire your entire kit. Next question. Andre Dole from Berlin asks: Could you please explain double natting and the issues with it? How to avoid this? Go ahead, Jason. Sure. Let's start with uh, NAT. NAT is network address translation. This is the thing a router does, where it takes um, internal, it takes packets that are requested by a device, and when that um, acknowledgement packet comes back down from the internet, it knows where to put it. So essentially, you know, this this network address translation is the sorting. It's the mail room of of you know your your incoming and outgoing packets. If you have two things handing out um, internal IP addresses that don't know about each other, that's where you end up with double NAT, double network address translation. And that gets really, really messy. How do you avoid it? Don't put a router under another router. All right, next question. Mickey Makator from Manila, Philippines asks, in what situations do you route between VLANs and in what situations do you outfit a client with an additional interface on a different VLAN? John? So when I'm routing between VLANs, like if uh, think about this for my corporate network or for your home network, like we talked about with the Apple TV, if I need something to share between multiple devices, 
and it needs to be segmented because I want to manage that from a security aspect or I want to just segment my devices from logicality. Um, so I will go ahead and create that VLAN for my my Crestron device I'm going to share to or an Apple TV, and I'm going to allow other devices to talk into that network. Uh, and then I also set up what's called IGMP. And so that is going to allow those devices to discover each other across multiple layer two do- networks. Um, and then what you're doing is when I'm going to provide a different VLAN uh, or additional interface on a different VLAN, if I want to segment a device on a tr- traffic, so I have I have the devices right here, right? So we have the, the Zoom traffic is happening on one NIC and I want my audio completely segmented from the OS, the operation side into a different NIC. So we have the USB-C adapters plugged in. So Dante is completely segmented from the Zoom traffic that's happening on the same device. And just for some of the audience, the NIC, it's the network interface channel. So that's like Wi-Fi would be one NIC, Ethernet would be another NIC. Uh, if you had a USB-C to Ethernet, it'd be a third. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Bo? Usually uh, in my world, it's it's I'm bringing in a kit to a stadium or somewhere, and then I'm usually getting some lines from whatever the host I'm, you know. When I'm interfacing with a network that I don't control, a lot of times then I'll throw the machines on a separate NIC. Um, I'll keep my stuff separate so that I'm not accidentally DHCPing something on their network and they're not you know, interfering with my network. I'll just keep those separate within the computer. Next question. All right, I'm asking, I need to move my Backblaze backup client off my Zoom computer. Should it be on a separate VLAN? I also need to, move, uh, need to bandwidth limit it so that Zoom is not affected by continuous file uploads. Alex? At least. <laughs> like, like when you have an automatic thing, I mean, I would give it a whole other internet connection. Like it, it is, uh, you know, like the back, automatic backups are just the devil. Like it's just, you know, the automatic backups over the internet are just so dangerous, um, in my opinion. Um, so you definitely want at least a VLAN, if not a whole nother internet provider that you're just going to put that on. And that's all it does. Um, because it just, I have, um, I can trace back, like for instance, with Dropbox, Dropbox, you can access Dropbox all through the web and that's how I handle it. Like I do not put drop that app on my, on my computer for so many reasons. Um, but you do not want you want to try to avoid automatic traffic usage of your network, in my opinion, um, for most of us, unless you have somebody, you know, so VLAN is, is a minimum, um, but I would be, just be very careful of it. It's why I don't have things like Backblaze is mostly because I'm, uh, uh, I don't like things automatically grabbing onto my network, any part of my network. Who is that? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, CJ. Uh, next question. Next question is from Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. What YouTube channels and personalities should I subscribe to in order to understand Ubiquity, Unify, and VLANs on my level? Not corporate, just small-scale home networking. I right, Go ahead, Bo. Uh, a couple good ones that probably cover a good bit of the Ubiquity stuff. Uh, Network Chuck's good. Techno Tim's good. Uh, Lawrence Systems has a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, that's a good start. If you want to, so if you want to go down the the, if you want to see what's going on on your network and go down the uh, the Wireshark path, uh, you can really fall down a rabbit hole with Chris Greer. It, there's a lot of good stuff there. We really need to get him on a second hour. Next question. And I'm asking. I run an analog uh, audio lines across my network copper cables. Should I replace my Cat six cables and shield uh, with shielded Cat seven cables as mitigation to ensure no noise radiates out from the network cables? John, no, I would not worry about that. There's not enough EMF that's being produced. The only time you really want to concern about that is if you're running power uh, parallel to your your network or audio lines. You never want to do that. Try to cross them over like a T. Uh, and then run them at least six feet apart. Next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia asks, uh, do I need another internet provider for my setup? I currently have one gig fiber. What should I add if needed? Go ahead, John. So if you have one gig fiber, that's great. Um, but you're not providing yourself any sort of redundancy. So if that that carrier has a change in the middle of the day or in the middle of your show, um, and they cause your internet to go out, or if a, uh, God forbid, someone hits a, a, a 
uh, a pole outside your house or down the street from you, you can lose internet. And so having a backup to that is important depending on how important or critical the work that you're doing uh, is in your network. Like at home, I don't have two internet connections. If I had the office hour rack in my house, I'd have at least two different internet connections. Here at the office, I have three. I don't want to, and then I'm also looking 20 miles away and making sure that none of the carriers I have share the same manhole, share the same telephone pole. Like I'm, I'm very conscious about what I'm doing. So it all depends on how critical your networks are and how much you want to spend. If you, you know, you can get Verizon, I think the home hotspot for like 25 bucks a month. And if you have a, a advanced router, a home net router you can plug in, you can have redundant internet for an extra 25 bucks a month. Is it worth it to you? Is it important enough? If it is, you can definitely make that decision. And Bo. Two things real quick. One, Tony, just want to say hi. I too am from Noonan, Georgia originally. Two, uh, John, you, you mentioned looking 20 miles out. How do you figure out where your network path goes when it comes to manholes and telephone poles? I, I feel like we've covered this years ago on this show, but is there a way to do that? Yeah. So you sign a lot of documentation and NDAs <laughs> and you work with these different carriers. Like I, I made a conscious decision when I moved into this new building of kind of what we wanted to do and making sure that there was no shared infrastructure across these multiple devices. We made sure that we had everybody who was on net to our building. Nobody was using a LEC, meaning that there's another carrier in between AT&T and you know, my building that would potentially cause an issue. And then I fully understood with maps that I could overlay on top of each other where they're going, what they're happening. We have a, a heat treat facility that's a couple uh, – uh, miles away. And there was one of the carriers who was running right over top of that. Like I've been in that building. It's a giant furnace on top of the building. I don't want to be over that. So I asked, I asked for them to move the cable, you know, so our run was no longer going on a telephone pole that was ran over that building. So again, it just comes down to the relationships you have. Obviously we're spending a ton of money and we have people all over the, the world who are connecting to our network and devices. And that's really important for us. So that's the, the amount of work that we put into designing our internal network. Wow. I had no idea I could have so much fun with VLANs. This is so cool. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you to our panel for such a great discussion today. Thank you for our, uh, to the producers for asking such great questions today, uh, not only in the first hour, but also about VLANs. I know we all feel enriched uh, walking out of this today. And also thank you to our uh, fantastic crew on the back end who's helping coordinate our uh, second hour guests today, coordinate all of us getting in, cutting the show, making us look and sound good. We could not do it without the small village that wakes up seven days a week to make this happen. Uh, coming up uh, again tomorrow, you've got the Office Hours Volunteers meeting, Q&A in the morning, and then introspection on Sunday. The Tlaloc Traversal Day, we've got 97,000 miles. That's 156,000 kilometers, which is 770 million bananas for scale. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in after hours. That was good. Guys, thank you so much. Yeah, that thanks was for awesome. coming in, guys. Yeah, but does your internet run over any bananas? That's really, really important. You know, I, I, I hear that you can, you can't, you can't really get good traffic after ten. Ten bananas is about as far as it goes. And, <laughs> it's and right. It's only if you're using fiber to connect those bananas. I, um, never run them in parallel. 12, yeah, twelve if they're not very ripe. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. A rotten and if, banana chip. And if they're brown, you can't get more than three. You know, like yeah, it's just, you know, need that, the, you all need they're good for right. at that point is, is banana bread. Yeah, and if you need a jumper, you can <laughs> sometimes you can get away with a plantain. Sometimes. Yeah. Banana bread, you're down to like slices, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's DSL internet. <laughs> okay. All right. See you guys. Thanks, see you guys. guys. Thank you.